has ever been clearer the absolute shambles that currently inhabits downing street than it was yesterday morning and listen i'm going to try to make you smile that is my duty that is my commitment to public service broadcasting i'm going to try to make you smile but it's not actually very funny is it when you when you really think about it it is quite funny when you think about honest bob jenrick uh, sent around the studios yesterday to defend and explain the decision taken by the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer to sign up for a pilot scheme, which we'd only really heard about before when Michael Gove uh, miraculously also qualified for and signed up for the same pilot scheme. Uh, and they were going to therefore be able to uh, do what you probably can't do and carry on as normal, despite having been contacted by the NHS Test and Trace system. That's, I think, when you get the phone call that says you've been in touch with someone. It's not when you are merely pinged. <clears throat> Actually, I've already spotted one illustration because I don't know whether you notice such things or whether it is the curse of pedantry that settled upon my youthful shoulders some 40 years ago, but they keep calling it the NHS track and trace, don't they? All of them. I mean, Cabinet Minister's down, I think Zahar, we did it this morning when he was on with Nick. Track and trace. It's not called track and trace. That's DHL, you prunes. That's what you do with your parcels when they haven't been delivered. Track and trace. That's the Royal Mail. Test and trace, it's called. Oh, jeez, you'd think after 18 months they might even perhaps have got the most fundamental, simple and basic vocabulary of the pandemic off pat, but no. And speaking of almost unbelievable levels of incompetence, back to honest Bob Jenrick. So yesterday he was sent around the studios to defend and or explain the uh, decision taken by Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak to swerve the sort of regulations and rules that the rest of us are more or less required to follow. In fact, I think in the context of the NHS test and trace, not t track and trace, lads, that's your parcels, test and trace, I think you're legally required to self-isolate unless you are signed up to this miraculous scheme that we'd never heard of uh, until Michael Gove uh, somehow qualified for it after attending the football in Portugal. So, honest Bob Jenrick, sitting in the back of a car on his way back from Sky. You can just imagine him, can't you? Uh, bending the ear of his poor, long-suffering chauffeur. God, I think that went pretty well, Perkins. I think that went pretty well, don't you? A few, few forward defensives, a couple of, uh, couple of uh, cover drives. <laughs> Pulled a leg from old Trevor Phillips. Oh, yeah, oh, thwack, boom. And, uh, yeah, old Johnson knows me one now. I've gone out and taken a bit of a beating for him, haven't I? Sticking up for him and his refusal to self-isolate. I'm terribly sorry. His absolutely correct and accurate uh, decision to avoid self-isolation. And then on the radio, you can just imagine it. He's sitting in the back of the car, patting himself on the back. Poor old honest Bob Jenrick. And it comes out on the radio. I, as, as I've got it, I've got it at 91 minutes after the first announcement was made. Although, according to the time mark on the uh, number 10 press releases that I've got in front of me, it was two and a half hours. So I, I don't know whether the press releases, official press releases, lagged a little bit behind the other timings. But no matter... Honest Bob Jenrick sitting in the back of a car, giving himself a little pat on the back for successfully dealing with the so-called media round of defending Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak's decision to swerve self-isolation when it's announced on the radio that Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are no longer swerving self-isolation and will in fact be abiding by the same rules and regulations that the rest of us are expected to abide by, even though it means that on Freedom Day, the three most important politicians in the country, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and in the context of a coronavirus crisis, the Secretary of State for Health, are all currently self-isolating. What does freedom look like? It looks like the three most senior politicians in the country hiding in their garden sheds. Or not hiding in their garden sheds. Self-isolating in the taxpayer-funded stately home that is Chequers, in the case of the Prime Minister. So, has it ever been clearer? Has it ever been clearer that he is making it up as he goes along? And the one thing that had been puzzling me... Well, lots of things puzzle me, as you know. I'd, I'd be out of a job if, 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 if they didn't. But the, the one thing that has been preying upon my mind more than all the other things has been this word, Freedom Day, this phrase, Freedom Day. It, 
it, it, it, it, I would say it had been weighing on my mind because I don't quite get it. You know, I, I, you sort of think it's so odd to say, I mean, we're back to Matt Lucas again, aren't we? From the very beginning of it, go, go out, don't go out, don't, don't, don't go out, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, uh, self-isolate, don't self-isolate, uh, sign up for a pilot scheme, don't sign up for a pilot scheme. We're, we're back there. And I couldn't quite pin it down. I, I, I just, why is this bothering me so much? It has bothered me for longer than it bothered me this morning to work out why George Michael was trending on Twitter. Have you worked out why George Michael is trending on Twitter yet? Yeah, come on, lads. I don't want your freedom. Yeah, well done. Poignant though, eh? Old George. And I couldn't get it. Why are they calling it Freedom Day while simultaneously telling us to carry on almost identically as we were before. I don't know if you've seen what the actual guidance is on the actual app at the moment. It, it, I mean, it, it, it almost beggars belief, but we've been down the rabbit hole so long now, you probably haven't even noticed how nuts this is. Most COVID-19, brackets, coronavirus, closed brackets, legal restrictions have been lifted in England, including in W4. Obviously, other postcodes do apply here. That just happens to be mine. You can still catch and spread COVID-19 even if you are fully vaccinated. You can continue to protect yourself and others by following the latest advice. Oh, but why have you called it Freedom Day then? If you're telling me that I can still catch it, I can still pass it on even if, as I am, I'm fully vaccinated and you're telling me I should still protect myself and others by following the advice that you've just freed me from having to follow. Are you still with me at the back? Are you free or are you not free? Are you free to follow? Are you free to not follow? What? what? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Sign up for a pilot, don't sign up for a pilot. Self-isolate, but don't self-isolate. So, what is the freedom here that we are supposed to be celebrating? And then I stumbled across... A really interesting article. There's a, a website called The Conversation. I don't know it well, but I, I've enjoyed some, some things that I've read upon there. And a chap called Colin Alexander, who I've never come across before. He's a political communications lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. And um, wh wh one of the things I like about The Conversation when I have stumbled across it is it publishes things like this. Colin Alexander does not work for, consult, own shares in, or receive funding from any company or organisation that would benefit from this article and has disclosed no relevant affiliations beyond their academic appointment. I quite like that. Because, you know, you hear someone shouting about Freedom Day and there is a little bit of you that wonders how many shares they've got in Weatherspoons. You know? Or you hear someone, the kind of person who was banging on about, oh, we never closed pubs during the Blitz. Do you remember we took those callers at the beginning of this? We never closed pubs during the Blitz. Have you got a brain cell to call your own or are you just borrowing it from your next door neighbour? Um, and, and that today has segued into, hooray, cry freedom for Harry and St George, or whatever it may be, despite being utterly, utterly meaningless. Because they're telling you to carry on obeying all the rules that you're now free not to obey if you want to protect yourself and to protect others. So I, I, I stumbled across this piece and, and, I, and I noted that they make a point on this website of uh, establishing their affiliation. So I, I'm the same, I can tell you now, I am paid by LBC, I'm paid by Global Radio, I have absolutely no other uh, influences or affiliations when it comes to telling you or the, the time we spend together every morning trying to work out what the hell is going on. Um, I am motivated only by a desire to understand things and through that give you information that you may not be getting anywhere else or insights. So that's why if I'm wrong, I love it when you ring me up and tell me. And you are, as ever, more than welcome to do so. So I don't have any affiliations. I don't have any shares in property companies. I don't have any um, uh, shares in, in pub companies or anything like that. I just want to know what's going on. So why are they calling it Freedom Day? And I read this article, um, and, and it picks up on some of the points I've just missed. References to the Blitz spirit. He's trying to work out why uh, we, we are calling it Freedom Day. And I think he's nailed it. He's done a much better job than I've managed. References to Blitz spirit, the militarization of language around and heroization of the NHS. The attention on, on the Second World War veteran Tom Moore as this flagship of British determination and sacrifice are just a few of the ways that this history of a propaganda, and propaganda can contain truth, has manifested in COVID Britain. It's a great piece. I've tweeted it this morning. But here's the kicker. Calling it Freedom Day 
attempts to nullify the public by encourage, encouraging us not to scrutinise government and media performance as we should. It reflects an attempt to move the discussion from science, sociology and public health to patriotism and emancipation. Now, I think he has nailed it. That is what has been bothering me. That's what has been bugging me. Why are they calling it Freedom Day and in the same breath telling us to carry on doing exactly what we were doing before Freedom Day? Answer, because it creates a sort of brouhaha. It creates a sort of party atmosphere. It's a heck of a lot more hollow than it was last time round, which was either July the 4th or VE Day or Christmas, I forget. But again, we find them cheerleading, despite the fact that the cheers are getting sadder and and slower and shallower but he's still doing come on freedom day he was supposed to make a big speech today in which he'd be once again a sort of pound shop winston churchill attempting to talk about fighting the virus on the beaches and 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 seeing it off never before in the history of human conflict all of that and yet what it is designed to do is take our eyes off the actual ball and what is the ball the ball is the virus but more importantly the ball is the epic the unparalleled the almost unbelievable failure to provide either clarity or leadership since the very first moment of this catastrophe some of it forgivable first wave probably unavoidable the rest of it utterly utterly unforgivable, culminating yesterday in them attempting to wriggle out of the sort of responsibilities they're telling the entire country to follow, and then 91 minutes later, wriggling back in again because they realised that this time we weren't going to put up with it. So, does he have a question or is he just going to wang on for the whole three hours this morning? Well, 52.48 at the moment on that one, but I suppose I should throw a question up there and see if you fancy answering it. Why are they calling it Freedom Day and in the same breath telling us to carry on doing everything that we were doing before we were free? Come on, 0345 So quite a simple one for me today. Why are they calling it Freedom Day? Why are they still calling it Freedom Day? When the three most important politicians in the country in the context of coronavirus are self-isolating, one of them with it, at least one of them with it, and the official guidance, although not the rules, is that we should all carry on behaving in exactly the same way that we did before we were ostensibly free. Have a crack at that. And as ever, although it's getting an increasingly forlorn plea, isn't it, every morning, if you've got an answer to that question that is charitable or... Uh, uplifting, optimistic, and not yet more evidence that we are being governed by an absolute shower of shoddiness, then I'd really like to hear it today. But that's the question. Why are they still calling it Freedom Day when the three most important politicians in government are under house arrest and the rest of us are being told to carry on obeying all the rules that aren't rules anymore? Riddle me that. And before we get stuck into the question of why they're still calling it Freedom Day when the three most senior politicians in the country with regard to this particular crisis are all under house arrest and the rest of us are being told to carry on following all the rules that we uh, no longer have to follow, uh, I'm just going to remind you of yesterday's absolute cluster fun. The uh, attempt by Robert Jenrick to defend conduct, which was official, and then Boris Johnson's attempt to lie about what Robert Jenrick had spent the entire morning doing. So here's Honest Bob. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister have been contacted overnight by NHS Track and Trace, which shows that the system is doing its job. They will be isolating, but using the pilot scheme for daily testing, which is available to a range of public sector organisations, which enables you to do your essential business and get tested on a daily basis in specialist asymptomatic testing centres like the one that there now is in Downing Street, but then outside of that work environment to not socialise, not mix with other people. And as Honest Bob is being driven home in his chauffeur-driven ministerial limousine, up pops his boss to say this. We did look briefly at the idea of uh, us taking part in uh, the, the pilot scheme which allows people to test daily, but I think it's far more important that everybody sticks to the same rules, and that's why I'm going to be self-isolating until the 26th of July, Monday, the 26th of July. 
So there it is. I don't know how hard you're tugging your forelock this morning, but he just looked you in the eye and said, we did look briefly at the thing that we announced officially on Downing Street uh, press releases and then sent a Minister of the Crown uh, around the television and radio studios of the land to both defend and explain. You can't have it both ways. Doff cap, tug, forelock, vote, Johnson. Either you looked at it briefly and decided not to do it, or you sent honest Bob Jenrick around the studios to tell everybody that you were doing it and why. I'll say that again for the furiously hard of thinking. Either you looked at it briefly and decided not to do it, or you issued an actual official government press release saying that you were doing it and then sent honest Bob Jenrick around every studio in the country to explain not only that you were doing it, but also how and why you were doing it. OK. Freedom Day. Jake's in Tufnell Park. Jake, what's going on? What they're trying to do, it's a, it's a terrible and shameless attempt to reposition the blame. So if you get the virus next week, for example, they can now say, you didn't take personal responsibility, but we kept the, everything open for businesses. And what that's trying to do is to morally exonerate themselves from having to deal with the rising number of cases and inevitably hospitalizations and then sadly deaths at the end of that. If they can remove themselves and say, we're letting you guys do what you want to do and everyone should like wear a mask and take personal responsibility, it's your choice now. If it's everyone's choice, it's not their choice. And that's what they're doing. And it is so shameless and it's careless and it's indicative of this incredible pat yourselves on the back and make sure that we're all doing brilliantly. Well, meanwhile, people are isolating and being pinged. It's just, why, it's shameless. Why then did they not do it a month ago or two months ago? Because the pressure wasn't great enough. They had, they're, so, they're trying to appease everyone. And I, I, I do sympathise for how difficult the situation is. You've got to appease the businesses on one side and the hospitals on the other side, the NHS on the other side. But clearly the pressure from the business side of things got far too great. And then the narrative changed to we have to live with it. And that coincided beautifully with the highest number of cases since the second spike. And they are so careful about backtracking in such a big way that... They did it once and they moved Freedom Day a month forward, a month back. And now it's like, well, what, how, how, much, how many times can we keep doing this? How many times can we keep giving people the false hope, the false glimmer of hope? And so they're doing it, but at the cost of you being responsible for your own illnesses. Uh, so if you get COVID now, it's on you. And that's baked in. And this is why the first thing Javid said... <clears throat> well, I think the first thing he did as health secretary was actually to catch coronavirus, but that, he probably didn't realise at the time. The second thing he did as secretary of state for health was to posit this figure of was it fifty thousand or a hundred thousand a day by the by the by next month? It was month, fifty thousand by nineteenth of June. By, I think. by July. By the well, no, it is fifty thousand by the nineteenth of July. I, I think he suggested it would be a little later than that, but they baked it in then. So the the, the idea is that it runs through the population like a dose of salts. Um, the original calculation was, of course, that we would be e either more vaccinated than we are now or what would run through the population like a dose of salts would be the pre-Delta variants, which means it wouldn't be anything like as infectious as it currently is. But the, I guess the facts have changed, to use that uh, famous quote uh, uh, attributed to John Maynard Keynes, the facts have changed, but they haven't changed their mind. That, that's the key. And the Freedom Day thing might have worked as a rhetorical flourish if the Delta variant hadn't been here and if the vaccine rollout had continued at the pace that it, that it started. I wonder whether if... I mean, I think Sajid Javid is hanging on to not being Matt Hancock at the moment as his biggest strength. And I wonder whether if Matt Hancock would be in charge of this decision, whether people would be as forgiving and as... Uh, sympathetic to the decision because I think Sajid Javid is riding off that wave of obviously the whole debacle with Matt Hancock's personal life. Not being him is a huge plus at the moment. I, I like it. Well, I don't like it, obviously, but I, I, I mean, in the context of appreciating the quality of your commentary, I like it. I don't like the uh, plausibility quotient of what you've just said because I think it's pretty hard to resist. And I have resisted that that idea of it being... Uh, an attempt to pass the buck on to all of us for the reasons I touched upon with Jake is that they could have done that at any point but of course you know we're overthinking it again this is timing as much as it is anything else timing and opportunism so just because they undertook a u-turn in 91 minutes flat yesterday in the most humiliating and public of ways doesn't mean that they would be comfortable undertaking another massive nationwide humiliating u-turn on this they've, they've staked what 
is left of their reputations on, quotes, Freedom Day, end quote. So they're just going to carry on pretending that it's a good thing. It's, it is, a, I mean, you'd think, the stupidest thing for me at the beginning of this was, was the, well, we didn't shut the pubs during the Blitz. Like, getting bombed by the Luftwaffe was contagious. You know, I mean, we didn't turn the lights off during the... Yes, we we did. And actually, we did shut a lot of pubs. And actually, it turned out there were gas mask sceptics around during the Blitz. Did you know that? There were people who now would probably pop up on Question Time or GBBs explaining why they think gas masks are a terrible affront to our liberty. I don't call them gas masks. I call them face muzzles, actually. And I'm not going to wear one. So it, none of this is ever new. What is new is having the government essentially driving the maddest element of our media and our society into ever madder positions. So from we didn't shut the pubs during the Blitz, we now arrive at, it's Freedom Day! But please carry on doing exactly what we ordered you to do before you were free, but you're not actually currently ordered to do. We're just hoping that you'll do it. And if you don't, it's all your fault. Ah, go on. Jake's nailed it already. Tell him he's wrong if you can, because I can't. Matt's in Oxford. Matt, what do you reckon? Uh, hi, James. Hello, uh, so I, I, think, I think we're giving them a bit too much credit, to be honest. Oh, that's um, not an accusation I, think, I, think, I, I, I often have to field, but let's see where it leads. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but I think, I think the point is that it's, it's nothing to do with really any kind of logic position of it. It's much more to do with the fact they just can't deliver bad news. Mm. They have this inability to say anything bad to the country. So you could have had a logical position, I think, yesterday, which says, yesterday morning, right, the Prime Minister's not going to self-isolate because he's the Prime Minister. But that yes. would be bad news. Yes. And therefore, we're not going to have that conversation with the population. Now, you can go one way or the other in the sort of leadership angle of he should be leading by example. And maybe the answer would be, you know, uh, he self-isolates and Rishi Sunak cracks on with his pilot. But I think, I think ultimately, it's much more about the fact that they just can't bring themselves to deliver bad news to the population of the UK. God, well, I mean, that is a bit of a skeleton key then, isn't it, really? Because we haven't mentioned the B word yet, and it's, it's nearly half past ten, so we're doing pretty well today. We might break the new record. I think the record's currently 48 minutes. Uh, but, but they can't, in the context of the B word, they can't deliver any bad news because it's all their fault and they're still in sort of weapons-grade denial about everything. But in the context of coronavirus, it's a psychological flaw, incapable yeah. of delivering bad news. Well, so, so the, the next one would be that... Um, it, it, you know, you look at why have we got the Johnson variant, as you uh, so uh, mm. neatly termed it, in the United Kingdom? Well, we've got it because he didn't close the borders. Yes. He was unable to deliver bad news to Miranda, Narendra Modi, and I don't want to use the B word, I'll, I'll try sure. and protect your record a little yes, longer. But, um, but I think, um, I think uh, he wanted to put that fig leaf of the trade That would have on, been good news. The... Pretend good news. A Potemkin <laughs> village of good news, but, but you yeah. know, uh, ostensibly good news nonetheless. Absolutely. But then when we come to France, we can have this conversation about um, why are we doing this sort of ambulance plus. Thing. But it's, they're not having an honest conversation because they can't bring themselves to deliver bad news. You know, and that's, why the, that's why the entire conversation, the thing that has perhaps befuddled me the most in recent months, the, these entire conversations are conducted without reference to our international standing on the most new cases table. Now, we test more than a lot of other countries, and there's no way that we've, if we were testing everybody in the population right now, there's no way we've got more cases than India. But these are the only measures that we have, and they are helpful. And all of these conversations, we're third in the world today, we've just, just fallen behind Indonesia again, and they're screaming Freedom Day from the rooftops. I mean, it is, it's objective bonkers, isn't it? And yet, if, if the reason is that they can never ever deliver bad news, and, and saying that the closest they've come is postponing it once, right? That's the closest they've come to delivering bad news. Yeah, I think that's true. But I, I think when you go back to the, you know, the international comparisons, it comes back to the bad news thing again. International comparisons are great. We're doing much better than Italy in, in, uh, yeah. in March of 20, mm. 2020. Now international comparisons are bad. Yes, and, and, and then when the vaccines were, were going quite well, they were good again. So we were hearing about that constantly, although even on percentage terms now, I told you that the gap would be narrowed. I thought it would be narrowed possibly by the time we played Germany in the Euros, but uh, it's taken a little bit longer. So just to tell you, in the context of percentages where we've been ahead for a while, we're now on 67.9, Belgium 66.5, Denmark 65.9, Portugal 62.5, Spain 61.5, Italy 60. So we're no more, we're, I mean, we're, we're mere points better vaccinated in terms of total numbers we're actually behind germany now so we're not better vaccinated than other populations that are still being a lot more careful than we are why are we celebrating freedom day when we are no more vaccinated than other european countries and we've got loads more cases 
and the three most senior politicians in the context of tackling the coronavirus are currently under house arrest. Freedom Day. Nothing says freedom like having the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Secretary of State for Health. <sighs> confined to their homes. Why are they still calling it Freedom Day when the three most senior politicians responsible for calling it Freedom Day are currently confined to their homes and the rules that they have uh, abolished this morning, the official advice is that we should still continue to obey them. And, and a little later in the programme, we may turn our attention to nightclubs. <clears throat> Nothing to do with coronavirus. I'm just going to talk you through some of the most slapping tunes of the... Well, no, obviously, I, I, I can't do that on this radio station. Um, but, but, but the pictures. And, and this is where you have to remind yourself. You have to give your head a wobble if you're as old as I am. And you have to remember that you were young once. Hard though it is to believe. And I would have gone clubbing. Nine, I'm 52, 48. No, I'm more, much more than 52% sure of it. I'm sure I would have done because I thought I was immortal and I'd have felt cooped up like a pressure cooker. And uh, it's easy to mock and laugh and sneer at all the young people talking about feeling fantastic and getting on one at the first opportunity. I'd have been there, front of the queue. Actually, I, I wouldn't have had to queue. I was already VIP'd up to the eyeballs at that stage in my life. But hey-ho, I'd have given you a wave as I swanned past to the velvet rope. And, and I would have gone. But... At the same time, and I think this is pretty close to the, the, the best example of cognitive dissonance I've ever given you from my own brain, as opposed to those of the people that we're not going to mention because we're trying to break the record for not saying the B word out loud. I, I would have gone if I was 21. I'm 49 and I think it's stupid. I think it is such a daft thing to have done, to have reopened the clubs already. Again, if he hadn't let in the Johnson variant, I probably would be thinking, yeah, they've got to roll the dice at some point, let's roll it now. But they're rolling the dice on exactly the same day they were going to roll it on if they hadn't let in the Johnson variant. And that's madness. On the other hand, I, I believe it's called euphoric recall, someone was telling me. When you see, when you see the whole dance floor start jumping up and down, I have two thoughts. One is, oh, I wonder if I'll ever go clubbing again. Last time was a stag night. It's going to be second marriages before I get invited on another stack night. <laughs> so, God knows. Where will we could probably go and play golf or something. <laughs> what do you do on a second marriage stack night? Do you all go to Britain in Portugal for a game of golf or something like that? Uh, so that's my first thought is, will I ever get on one again like that? And my second thought is always, I don't know uh, whether other people appreciate this, but the ritzy nightclub on Oxford Road in Manchester that had a, a legacy of the 1960s, it still had a sprung dance floor. So it had a bit of bounce in it. The dance was actually sprung. I don't know what it had underneath, hydraulics or just loads of slinkies. But that's my second thought when I see an entire uh, dance floor jumping up and down. I always think of the Ritzy in Manchester and that extra bit of, of bounce that you'd get when you started... Uh, not pogoing. I was never into that sort of music as a, as a clubber, but... Oh, and that's euphoric recall. 10.38, Joe's in Newcastle up on time. Joe, what's going on? Oh, hi, James. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I should welcome. sort of state, as I introduce myself, that I am a consultant in intensive care medicine, um, and I'm currently sort of recovering from, a, a, like a lot of my colleagues at the moment, from a bout of burnout. Oh, um, I'm I bet you are. considerably better than I was. Okay. Um, and there's lots of plans in place to help me with my rehabilitation so it was Just, i think i mean absolutely the, whacked out or, or worse i mean are we talking like a possibly it, even it, you, you, you're talking worse i mean as well as work especially over the winter um i've had family bereavements oh, cancer sorry. scares because uh sorry it sounds like a tale of woe no it really why do you always do it? this you doctors who spend your whole lives looking <laughs> after us and then you feel guilty when you need a little bit of looking so, after yourself I don't know why you so, do yeah, that. So, yeah, so rehabbing allows me to listen to LBC at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and the, the, the point I'm trying to get over, I have no answers, but from my perspective, it seems that constantly throughout the pandemic, but particularly as the leading to today, there's been this false narrative of economy versus COVID healthcare yeah. versus other forms of healthcare. And... And it's almost like you have to have one at the expense. You know, we, we need we need the economy restarted. We need to do all the cancer operations. But actually, by complete opening up before we've got a sort of 75, 80% herd immunity through vaccination, we're just creating problems 
further down the line for ourselves, especially as, as winter encroaches. And I think this comes about, and I'm not going to name any specific individual here, but mm. we have multiple politicians that are actually incapable of managing expectation and conveying uncertainty with any form of empathy towards individuals and the population as a whole. And for, for people that work in intensive care, that's, uh, that is a, 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 the polar opposite of what we often, well, not often, what mm. we do on a day-to-day -day basis is convey uncertainty. And I think that's where a lot of people like me struggle with today's concept That's of nicely Freedom Day. Well, here's, here's the, the, the article I referred to at the top of the show, taking up the point you're just making, actually. It's, it's, though not an official designation, this popularisation of this moment with, with such a saying as, as Freedom Day closely follows two, uh, writes Colin Alexander, of my ten golden rules of propaganda. First, appeal to the instincts rather than the reason of the audience. So reason would involve risk and, and acknowledging all the things you've just described. Instincts is a little more atavistic, well a lot more atavistic than that. So first, appeal to the instincts rather than the reason of the audience and second, build around a slogan. Then repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's almost the polar opposite of a scientific training or a medical training, which is why it sticks in your craw so completely. That's very true. That's very true. That's my point, mate, James. I'll, um, <laughs> I'll Joe, look after yourself, mate, and then pro promise me one thing: that don't, don't, don't ever apologise for feeling run down or for or for needing a little bit of space. Because God knows how many families you've helped, even possibly helped them avoid the worst of all possible scenarios, uh, or indeed process the reality of having to confront the worst of all possible scenarios. So, if anyone's earned a break, Joe, it's people like you. All right. Well, that's very kind of you. Thanks very much. Everybody, everybody listening is thinking the same, I promise. And you take care as well. James is in Glasgow. James, what would you like to say? I would, I would like to just, just point out, I, I, I agree 100% with what you said about the propaganda and the consultant. Common sense, I feel, has just packed its bag and left the planet. Well, no, I, I, I mean, what is it, though? Because common sense was the early version of personal responsibility, wasn't it? And and it, it's fine yeah. if, if you're talking about what you can do to protect others, what you can do to protect yourself from X, but you can't protect yourself from someone who's not protecting themselves from X, can you? You can't That's protect right. yourself from crossfire if there is a bloke in Leicester Square with a firework up his jacksie. Yeah, but what the, the, point, the point I would like to make is that we sat back here at the very, when this, when this went through Turkey and it was creeping west, hmm. we sat back and watched it. We watched it on the TV, we watched there in, in, uh, in China when the chemical biological suits uh, disinfecting bus stops and roads and drains. We saw, we, we saw all that happening as it spread across Europe. Yes. And we, we're in Ireland. We could have closed the, the, the travel corridors. I, I don't. I, I, you're right, James. Uh, but you know, I, I did take this call in 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 April of 2020. I'm looking, at, and I, I, I know there is a big Groundhog Day feeling to proceedings at the moment. But we are asking yeah. a slightly different question this morning, which is why are they, and and that is the media, very much doing the bidding of the government, calling it Freedom Day, when the three most senior politicians in the country are under. Um, uh, yep. effective house arrest and the, the official guidance they're giving us is that we should all carry on obeying all the rules that aren't rules anymore. So why call it freedom? Why let this get into the public bloodstream? Why wasn't Kwasi Kwarteng this morning saying, I, well, let's not call it that because obviously it's not freedom, is it? It's it's cautiousness no. and common sense that we're looking for. Yeah. I, I think what you just said, said there about propaganda, hmm. it, that's, that's what it is. That's the media have jumped on the government bandwagon and, and they're trying to convince the populace that everything's cool, and it's not. No, and, and, and that's the scary thing. And, and again, it's not a question of, of should we just carry on under the circumstances we were under yesterday. Something has to loosen, something has to lighten. So maybe do this, but don't do that. But the idea that you just lift it all, like a, I don't know, like a curtain at the theatre, it just comes up and that's it. You go from naught to a hundred in a nanosecond. That just makes no sense. Unless you can tell me why it makes sense. And you can do that in all the usual ways. But most welcome would be a call to 0345 60 60 973. Uh, 1045 
is the time. And, and of course, you are... It is a nice text. You really sound rather pathetic, O'Brien. You have your anti-Boris supporters on, uh, but no one else, everyone else is just laughing at you. Mate, ring in. Seriously. I, I, I mean, I, Boris Johnson lied to you yesterday. Tell me why that makes you happy. And, and, and why it makes you laugh at me for pointing out that he's lying to you. You know, I, I'm sad on your behalf. I'm here to protect people like you and, and to point out that you've been taken for a ride. Here's a line from The Lion and the Unicorn, which Orwell wrote in, in 1941, part one, England, your England, when he reflects upon patriotism and the, the false representations of patriotism that dodgy politicians have used throughout the ages. He's describing what England really is, not the jeweled isle of Shakespeare's much-quoted message. And remember, this is in 1941, nor is it the inferno depicted by Dr. Goebbels. It's a lovely piece, um, which I heartily recommend, and it, and it ends like this. Still, it is a family. It has its private language and its common memories, and at the approach of an enemy, it closes its ranks. A family with the wrong members in control, rings a bell, that perhaps is as near as one can come to describing England. And I like that, and that's why the culture wars are so vile, because that line there it has a private language and its common memories, and at the approach of an enemy, it closes ranks. And we have in Downing Street, and I'm going to say the B word now, because we've broken our record, it's 50 minutes now, write that down, will you? So it's a new, a new record. Because of Brexit, they have to keep the ranks separate. These absolute rankers. They have to keep the ranks separate because of Brexit, and so we couldn't close ranks when we came up against a common enemy. Uh, uh, we couldn't revert to being a family with the wrong members in control, and, and that is heartbreaking. I'm fairly confident, as I read out that uh, quote from George Orwell, that Orwell himself won't be ringing in. Uh, however, Colin Alexander has. Colin Alexander is the um, academic whose work in the conversation on the Conversation website I began the programme quoting today, a lecturer in political communications at Nottingham Trent University. Colin, how lovely to have you on board. Thank you for ringing in. I presume someone pinged you this morning and said, that idiot O'Brien on the radio is completely misrepresenting your latest work. You better ring in and put him straight. So, put me straight. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, James. Um, my friend Oliver was in his kitchen and he sent me a WhatsApp message and said, uh, you're on the radio, pal. So, it's a crack uh, here I am. Thank you for, for, for ringing in. It's a cracking piece. Um, I, I've shared the, the gist of it and a couple of choice morsels, just, just um, as the horse's mouth, so to speak, to tell my listeners what your central thesis is. The, the central point is that since the start of the... Um, the pandemic in March last year, we have been inundated with a, a very sophisticated propaganda mechanism that has asked us to think, do and feel in certain ways and to exclude other aspects of our personas. And that this structure emanates from wartime propaganda, um, particularly from um, from the Second World War. And this is one of the reasons why you see lots of references to the Second World War in, um, in the various sort of discourses mm. that we've seen over the last, um, over the last sort of 16, 17 months or so. I mean, thinking of the Blitz spirit, and you don't use the line, but some of my callers did in the earliest days, that we didn't shut the pubs during the Blitz, which is, I, I guess it, you could file that under catchy phrase, but utterly I meaningless. Mean, worse worse, worse stuff, than meaningless. Like, I was going to say, I mean, you've also done other stuff. I mean, there was, there was talk of having uh, Dame Vera Lynn's The White Cliffs of Dover there get it back to well. number one. There that was, wasn't that there? was happening a year ago. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, what I've puzzled over, particularly since Christmas, is, is whether or not there is a plan or whether or not the Dominic Cummings analogy of the shopping trolley with the wonky wheel, in the case of the Prime Minister, just veering cluelessly, smashing into one side of the aisle and then, and then cluelessly veering into the other side of the aisle and smashing into that as well. It's not binary, is it? It's not a zero-sum game. It's not either a plan or no plan. Your theory yeah. here, as, as explained, it does actually sound deliberate rather than accidental many aspects of government policy making seem to have been very random or very rushed or not thought through do, do you think this or, this does get filed sure. under master plan or not um okay so <laughs> a couple of things there yeah. um it's not I mean all the kind of um issues that we've seen some of them are 
genuine incompetence and some of them are um, entirely uh, avoidable. One thing I would say is though that is that Boris and his uh, and his team follow essentially a um, capitalist focused agenda in that the the response to COVID the the, the mechanisms that they engage are capitalist related um, and. And, and, and that's the kind of defining ideology that sits behind everything that they do. Now, the you know, I say the sort of the the, the various sort of, sort of issues that that we've had on the way, which Dominic Cummings refers to as being the sort of wonky wheel. Sure, I mean, most democracies are just trying to. Well, most governments uh, through democratic means are just trying to survive the week, let alone the year. This is why we don't have five and ten year plans like the Chinese do. But um, but, but essentially um, there is still a mantra and, and an ideology that sits behind everything that they do. And, and that is, I, I guess, what leads us to this, this deployment of the latest phrase. I'll read another paragraph, Colin, because it, it, I think it, it's timely. Freedom Day you write, is not a lie because restrictions will be lifted. However, the popularisation of it as such, rather than most restrictions, restrictions lifted day, for example, is part of a strategy endorsed by government and mainstream media alike that has wanted the British public to think, act, associate and feel in certain ways since the pandemic began. Now, my field of expertise, if I have one, is dealing daily with the people that you've just described, the people who do think, act, associate and feel in precisely the way that the government and the mainstream media wants them to. I, I, just a word, if you would, on wh why do they get so angry? They, they will be fuming at being described like that because they will recognise the reality of it. I, I, you know, I could turn to my inbox now and... and yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'll, I will as well. Yeah, so what, what, do you have any insights into that from, from, from your work and, and your yeah, research? I mean, you're, Why, you're, when you're, people you're, are, are described accurately, do they bridle against it so furiously? I mean, one of the things about propaganda is that, that the actual discussion of propaganda is quite an, emot an emotive subject. Nobody likes the idea that they've been hoodwinked mm. in some way and it makes them feel foolish or, or whatever. So one of, the, one of the things that the propagandist acknowledges is that they understand that there is going to be that psychological reaction to a conversation about propaganda. So your, your sort of previous caller, I think you were just talking about that, just that, that idea of um, if we know that the government lies to us, why mm. do we become defensive about that? Well, yes. essentially it comes down to, to feelings of power and powerlessness. If you feel powerless, then you often become quite defensive around your, and try to sort of avoid the reality of your lack of power. And then that, and that kind of manifests itself in all manner of um, sort of psychological defence mechanisms, if you like. Um, including projection, in, 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 yeah. including projection, and projection and avoidance, or, you know, and denial, and, and a kind of weaponized delusion. Um, Colin, exactly. thank you. I'm going to play you a little clip now that probably won't mean much to you, but your friend Oliver will explain its importance to you. All right. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it, they will come. Take care, Colin Alexander. Thanks. Thank you. 10.57 is the time, and that is Colin, the lecturer in political communications at Nottingham Trent University, whose article this morning prompted me to go down the line of asking why they're still calling it Freedom Day, um, or uh, allowing the media to call it Freedom Day, when the three people in charge are currently confined. The opposite of freedom. They are literally the opposite of free. You know, apart from being in jail, they couldn't be less free than they currently are. And they're the three people in charge, allowing this phrase Freedom Day to run through the country, propelled as ever by the right-wing media, like a do dose of salt. And, of course, then you lead immediately to question two, why are they still calling it Freedom Day, when the official guidance is to carry on doing what they're doing? And there's part of your answer. It, it removes the focus or the spotlight from the behavior of the government from the actual reality and from the science and instead replaces it with a sort of this is why i mentioned orwell before i introduced you to colin with that very bogus sense of patriotism that kind of my country right or wrong kind of patriotism which is how to knit together the two commentaries the one from george orwell and the one from colin alexander that is why people who are literally having their lives risked by a Prime Minister, or people who are literally being lied to by a Prime Minister, pop up in my inbox thinking that they're cheerleaders for him and that, that, that I'm the enemy and he's on their side. 
And that is it. I mean, there it is, the most perfect illustration, one from 1941 and one almost 80 years later to the day from 2021. How on earth do you get people who have been treated like absolute cattle absolute cattle treated like scum by their political leaders to sort of muster up some sort of anger and some sort of bushy-tailed uh, pride to defend the politicians that have been lying to them. You turn it into wartime rhetoric. You turn it into wartime propaganda. So Freedom Day and anybody who points out that that's a bit stupid is the enemy. Whereas really, really, the enemy should be the people who are lying to you. Blimey, that's the end of my TED talk. And you should wear a mask, limit social contacts and, and check in at venues, uh, isolate if you test positive, isolate if test and trace contact you, uh, quarantine if returning from a, um, a relevant country. But it's also Freedom Day and that's the confusion that we're attempting to map this morning. Why, why are they still calling it Freedom Day? Uh, and, and this is perhaps the best answer I've seen so far. 19th of July just doesn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> I like that. Um, and we'll move it on a little bit. Uh, it'd be hard, to be honest, because there's not much room on the... Oh, there it goes. There's no room at all on the switchboard. But um, that's our problem. We'll deal with that. It, 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 what are you doing? Not now. Don't ring me up and say I'm having an ice cream, James. I'm having a choc ice. Uh, we might do that on Thursday. But if, if you now have to assume responsibility... I, I mean, you may be too busy to give me a ring, but uh, if you're not, what are you going to do? So... Uh, D Donald's been in touch with a very, very, very valid point, actually, about the younger people. All we're hearing is young adults being irresponsible, and that's just not fair on them. James, give them a real criteria for what needs to happen, and they may come along with you. But you, like many others, are just telling them to suck it up. Um, I, I guess I am. I, I, to be fair, I, I said from the start, Donald, that in the context of clubbing, if I was that age, I'd be doing what they're doing. But I also somehow can hold in my head at the same time the knowledge that it's a really daft idea to have opened them up so completely um, overnight. I, I guess with a nightclub, it's all or nothing. You can't have a socially distanced nightclub, I don't think. But it, you raise a very, very valid point, which I can't deny. I haven't offered up an alternative to it, except keeping them closed for a little bit longer. And I, I guess I would say a COVID passport, if you pushed me to actually give you a substantive answer to your question of what's the alternative, I would say a COVID passport. If everyone's been double vaccinated, then you can rip the pants out of it. You can party like it's 1999. But that is still unpopular. And i tell you something I spotted. And again, I'm so sorry for not spotting this sooner. So some of you, as, as uh, one hugely toxic former resident of the public space is currently being deported from Australia, why do race baiters segue so quickly to COVID denial or, or, or vaccine denial or, or lockdown scepticism, as it was called? I, I was puzzling a little bit over that. I said to you quite a few times that I didn't understand. How could just being, being a toxic racist suddenly segue into being a lockdown sceptic, uh, uh, like it has for so many members of the Z list? And uh, the answer's obvious, isn't it? Because we fall into the trap of thinking that the truth matters. If the truth doesn't matter, if you're just in it for clicks and giggles, and uh, how do you pronounce it? Is it Patreon contributions? Or, or you get some, you just a uh, Patreon, Patreon? You just where you ask people for money. All you're in it for is clicks, giggles, and money. A bit of luck, you might get a booking on GBBs. Otherwise, you might have a YouTube channel or something like that, or you're filming yourself in your bathroom, um, saying, uh, dropping hard truths. How can they? Why? Why have all the racists suddenly jumped on the? Some people, of course, are actually doing it for a living in 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 my line of work. Although, thankfully, not in this building. So, how come all the racists have suddenly jumped on the COVID bandwagon? And I was genuinely puzzled by it. As someone pointed out to me, you you. you you're being daft. You're presuming that there's a logic to it. It's, it. What is the reward I get for saying toxic lies? Answer, profile, attention, money. Probably in that order, depending on what your priorities are. So if you've gone from telling toxic lies about racism, it's just a hop, skip and a jump to telling toxic lies about science or about a, a, a virus. So um, I'm not going to get an hour out of that, am I? That is literally the only answer to, to the question of why have all the racists jumped on the anti-vax bandwagon answer toxic lies have been commoditized in this country on a scale that we haven't seen uh, even in orwell's time i would argue but which we are going to be reaping the results of for generations to come so freedom day on the board still if you run a business what are you doing and what have you not so much what have you seen i don't think it's time yet for 
me to take calls from people saying, well, it was all right in my local Sainsbury's today, James. Something a little bit more substantive than that. As a business owner, what are you doing and how are you getting on? It might be too early to tell me how you're getting on, but I, I sense, looking at the polling and the huge support for not lifting all the restrictions today as they have done, uh, the, the, um, almost double, I think, saying they've made a mistake on this, but that actually does give some cause for optimism because I think most of us are going to carry on behaving exactly as we were before we were free not to. Um, the problem is, of course, that I can take responsibility only for my own actions. If you own a business, then in many ways you are responsible for the actions of others. So I, I just wonder how that's shaking down for you at eight minutes after 11. Jane is in Newant in Gloucestershire. Jane, what would you like to say? <laughs> yes, hello, James. Hello, well, I have to say, I did I did rather phone with tongue-in-cheek because you were asking about Freedom Day and so forth. And I just thought to myself, well, Freedom Day is all about the freedom to choose. Yes. And I know that sounds very simplistic and it's um, it's not meant to, but no, we've got to, we've no, got to take a step. Of we course. have got to take a step. And although I would imagine that there are some people listening to me saying, well, that's all well and good, but there are lots of people out there that are only interested in themselves and that only do what they want to do. But I'm sure that is probably true, but I would say that 90% of us are going to do the right thing. Yeah, I think you're probably right, the, actually. Even reluctantly, even reluctantly <laughs> some people. Like but again, that, that doesn't answer the question of why they've sort of legislated or de-legislated, if that's even a word for it, except mm. except for the propaganda argument, which is pretty close to unassailable, I think. Well, of course, you've got King Knut, haven't you? Yes, you have. You have, um, <laughs> although that is a slight misrepresentation, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. That, yes, you have to be careful. I suppose if you're saying it out loud, you're a lot safer than you are if you're writing it down, aren't you? But the, the King Canute well, yeah. legend is slightly misrepresented. As you know, he was trying oh, to pr prove to his advisors that he couldn't stop the tide coming in. It's, it's probably the most misrepresented oh. king in English history. Everyone thinks that he was there to, to try to stop the tide because he had such a high opinion yeah. of himself. He was actually yeah. trying to teach his barons that he wasn't as powerful as they thought he was by showing them that he couldn't actually stop the tide coming in but hey ho johnson would probably do it the other way around did you what, what i mean they, the fact that the three of them are now under house are, are now self-isolating they're now confined at home while the freedom day rhetoric is still running around the country like a bunch of delinquent toddlers in any other circumstance that would just be a mixture of hilarious and ridiculous but here it's just normal now that seems to be what we've become I know, and isn't it ridiculous that that it is normal? Yeah, well, you can't say. When, um... <laughs> Thank oh, you, Jay. No, it's all right. Something that for my fault, interrupting you while you were interrupting me. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. Ray's in Southampton. Ray, what do you reckon? Hi, James. How are you doing? I'm all right, actually. I, I'm very lucky to have this job. I, I just keep thinking back to Joe, the intensive do care doctor earlier, who's obviously taken a right pasting, both physically and psychologically. I, I, I sometimes wonder, Ray. <laughs> There you go. That's exactly how I'm feeling. I sometimes, I sometimes wonder how, where I'd be psychologically if I hadn't had this job, if I hadn't had this little outlet and this freedom every morning on the programme. But anyway, it was a figure of speech when you asked me. You weren't expecting uh, chapter and verse. What did you want to say? Um, essentially, so there, I think there, um, there's three reasons he's calling it Freedom Day. Is to appease the headbangers on the back benches like Brexit Harbour and Steve Baker. <laughs> yes, carry on. He's not just his usual followers, and unfortunately, you insulate yourself like I do. I do on Twitter. Follow people that are relatively like-minded that I like to think have a brain. Yes. Whereas there's so many, there's so many people that will be loving the fact that it's Freedom Day today. All you've got to do is just search hashtag Freedom Day. And you're saying people. Well, we saw oh, a hashtag. Well, it's, well, well it, done, but well done, Boris. It, yeah, maybe that's part of the answer to the question. In, 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 you know, why have they clung to it? Because some people like it, and yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm and then, quite well exposed sorry. to them. But of course, as which is often the case with these things. When you ask them why, it all falls apart like a cheap suit. But the trick is never to put yourself in a position where somebody asks you why. You just keep shouting exactly, it. Yeah. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Exactly, and, that, and that's, all, that's all they'll continue to do. And then if it does, if it does come to it, there's the, there's the two outcomes. Either, and God forbid it doesn't happen, if we go into another lockdown, he gets to give what he thinks another Churchillian-style speech, mm. and then he, he thinks he's saving everyone from himself. Or, alter or alternatively, it won't stick anyway. There's been scandal after scandal. Almost every other week there's a new scandal yes. that, you then, that then doesn't get spoken about. David Cam Cameron Greensill, Priti Patel losing police records, Robert Jenrick with the, ho uh, the housing mess last year, yes. Gavin Williamson exams, 
all of these things just get forgotten about week after week after week. It's disgusting. That's, so, I, th- I mean, it sounds like an odd way to describe it, but I think that's a, a bonus for them of the coronavirus. I don't think they've deliberately prolonged the coronavirus in order to camouflage. No, 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 of course not. But one, no, 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 one, no, I wonder what happens subconsciously, though, because certainly with the B word, you know, the, the absolute madness of Brexit is being camouflaged very effectively at the moment by coronavirus. So subconsciously, one wonders whether there would have been more of a sense of urgency if they weren't aware of what was coming up the tracks when we actually get out of the pandemic problems. Possibly, but yeah. again, as Cummins, as Cummins has said, he loves chaos. So the more chaos for him, the better. So that, no, no, that, no, no, that's, no, that's no. how he governs. Nice he, he governed yeah. that way prior to COVID. It was he's, just lived his ever, life. Ever, he's lived his life well, like that, but in the context of leadership, you, you know, it's amazing, isn't it? You can just drop these truths into the conversation, not from some, I don't know, some Marxist commentator on the new, on the new statesman <laughs> or whatever it may be, but the Prime Minister's most trusted advisor has quoted him as saying, I love chaos because everyone has to come to me to find out what to do, and, and, and you just drop it into a conversation on the radio. I do this for a living and I'd forgotten, but it is absolutely pertinent. Why, why yeah, is everything but, such a mess? Because the man in charge likes it that way. Yeah, completely. It is, it's very, very, and God forbid it's not as bad as, as it was the other side of the water, but it is just Trumpian. And, it, and this country is becoming more and more Trumpian by the week, it seems. And it's very easy to forget that if it wasn't for the uh, coronavirus, then Donald Trump probably would have won a second term. I, I, I had a, a dinner with some old pals from Fleet Street the other night, and um, they'd both been working in America at the time of the, the first election, and, and one had come back very recently, and I, I said, do you think, I guess everyone forgets that. Yeah, probably, would have done. It was, it was the pandemic that did for Trump, because the desire to believe the lies that you're being told is oddly powerful. And it's still working here at the polling. It doesn't seem to have been touched. The latest polling to come out on, on leadership by the um, uh, uh, taking the knee debacle. We'll see whether or not this latest uh, uh, catastrophe whatever you want to call it, has is, is going to touch the size. The numbers I was referring to earlier, do you think lifting most remaining COVID-19 restriction in England is the right or wrong thing to do today? 31% say right, 55% say wrong. So it's, it's populism that isn't popular. If the relaxation of coronavirus rules leads to a large increase in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations, who, if anyone, do you think would be mainly responsible? This is actually... I mean, if you're a fan of uh, these kind of uh, inquiries and these kind of statistics, albeit an opinion poll, which is not an exact science, this is stunning. Go on, have a guess at what well, it's not. It's not fifty-two forty-eight. All right, I, I, that that doesn't work. If the relaxation of coronavirus rules leads to a large increase in COVID nineteen cases and hospitalizations, who, if anyone, do you think would be mainly responsible for this? Forty-two percent say the government whereas the percentage of people polled who said individuals is 42 percent i don't i know i haven't found out yet i've been doing this job a long time and what keeps me fresh keeps me honest keeps me bright-eyed and bushy-tailed is dealing with new problems so i haven't worked out yet how to successfully segue i do like that word from a conversation that we're having when loads and loads of you are still keen to have it into a conversation that I would like to have without necessarily completely abandoning the conversation that we're already having, that loads of you are keen to continue. So you can do it like a guillotine. You can go, right, it's 12 o'clock, time to move on, let's change topics. But I don't like that on days like today because I think that the um, uh, contemplation of, of this dread phrase, Freedom Day, is really interesting and, and timely and should, in a sense, run through the whole show or at least through more of the show than a very neatly... Um, uh, contained hour but uh, of course it's harder to get through when i want to find new calls so this is a churn as, as i believe the grown-ups call it this is a churn for business people business owners or managers who are as of today and it may be too early to do this in which case we'll come back to it tomorrow as of today you have got a lot of responsibility. I, I would say you've got responsibility that you're not being paid for. That's another mark of Brexit Britain, isn't it? When you think back to the scenes at Wembley last Sunday, a huge part of the problem was surely the fact that you had a bunch of kids, presumably on minimum wage, put there by these supply companies that seem to have a finger in pretty much every pie going now. And they're suddenly expected to be a combination of 
you know, hardcore bouncer, intelligence officer, and policeman or woman, in, uh, as, as rampaging fans of coke addled hooligans come tearing up the escalators towards them without any tickets, and you're there on minimum wage, presumably, or not far off, and suddenly you're supposed to be a sort of cross between Robocop and the Incredible Hulk. It's absolute madness. But, um, you are paid to run a business, to manage a premises or, 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 or an outfit. And I think today, again, if, if, if this is just wrong, then your call will also be welcome. You, you have a little bit more responsibility resting on your shoulders today than you normally do. I hope you're comfortable with that. I really do. And I'm keen to hear from you about how, how it is, how it's feeling. How's it, how, how are you handling it? I suspect, as most of our callers would attest, that a huge proportion of people because the thing about this polling here and that 42 percent 42 percent a on who are you going to blame if it all goes pear-shaped the government or individuals each other of course is, is the way of phrasing that best that that's part of the reason for the freedom day rhetoric well if we do this and do that's what the first caller said this morning jake i think is 42 percent 42 percent almost proves his point if it all goes belly up then only half of us are going to blame the government and the other half are going to blame each other and that's got to be a win for the government when it is obviously and entirely their fault. 42% of the population are going to blame each other. 42% of the population are going to blame the government. Um, it should be 100% of the population blaming the government. So they'll take that as a win. They'll be laughing all the way to the food bank. But the, but the, but the question of running a business and how you're going to handle that, that has now come down on your shoulders. And, I, and I'm just keen to know what you're doing, how you're finding it. Because that other poll, the 31% think it's right to lift the restrictions and 55% think it's wrong. I think this is quite important. There'll be plenty of people within the 31% who are still going to behave as they were behaving last week. Don't read that poll as 31% are going to go to the nearest face-licking festival at the very first opportunity, right? That, that is people saying, no, it's right to lift the restrictions, but I will still be abiding by them. There'll be a lot of people within that 31% like that. I, I, if it wasn't for the variant, the Johnson variant, I'd probably be in that category. That it is right to lift the restrictions. I wish it was being done with more clarity and more leadership, but, you know, this is the government that we've got. So I would be, it, yes, it's right to lift the restrictions. We have to lift them at some point. The, the combination of vaccinations and low infection rates would have created an environment in which it made sense, so I would have been in favour of it, but I would probably have still have worn a mask on public transport, you see? And, and that's... I, I wonder whether that is missing slightly from the analysis of these numbers. So 55% think it's wrong to lift restrictions. You can be confident that they're all going to carry on abiding by the restrictions, or almost all of them. Otherwise, they put themselves in this bizarre category of thinking it was wrong to lift the restrictions, but I'm going to my local face-licking festival. And I can't imagine there's many people in that category. 31% of people think it's right to lift restrictions doesn't mean that 31% of people are going to be turning up at their local face-licking festival at the first opportunity. A lot of them will be living just as responsibility, just as responsibly as the people who don't think it's right to lift restrictions. And as I say, I keep saying, because, you know, you've got to recognise light at the end of any tunnel. If it wasn't for the Johnson variant, I, I think this would be the right course of action. But the Johnson variant has changed everything. It's why we're now third in the world again, in terms of new infections, and first in the world when it comes to lifting all restrictions. I can't see a world in that which ma that makes sense. But anyway, that's all a very long roundabout way of saying, if you're running a business, either as the owner or the manager... How has your life changed already this morning, if indeed it has? 0345 6060 973. Warwick's in Pinner. Warwick, what do you reckon? Well, when I phoned in, the argument, the, the discussion was rather different. You had asked us um, what... No, I'm doing... Well, have... I just spent 20 minutes saying I'm doing both, Warwick. We're, we're uh, having a conversation in, in, about in, Freedom Day and in about the, well, how the business owners well, and managers are coping with well, it. Well, one, one reason for rejoicing... Um, at the, on this Freedom Day, despite the insanity of the times in which we find ourselves, yes. is that yesterday, I think, a very significant worm turned. <laughs> uh, ten past nine yesterday morning on the Ma programme, the editor of The Sun described the John's first Johnson plan, uh, not to self-isolate, as outrageous. Mm. Now, if the 
Johnson cheerleaders feel that way about it, then I think there is hope that the 42-42 split may well go the other way eventually. Do, well, I wonder, I, it'd be an interesting question, wouldn't it, to see whether or not they lanced that particular boil by doing the U-turn so quickly. I, I, I mean, remember, U-turn if you want to, the lady's not for turning. Those days are long behind us, but, but would the speed with which this reverse ferret was undertaken undo some of the potential damage that you're suggesting? I don't know. I, 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 don't know I think either. it just made them look even more stupid than usual. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, Especially it, honest it, Bob Jenrick. When, when, when Jenrick was on there a few minutes afterwards, mm. um, I said to my wife, how long before the U-turn? And it turned out to be about 78 minutes. Was it, have you got 78 on your sweepstake? Uh, I wish I had. I think I, I think I had 91, but yeah, 158, I think, the, the Daily Mail have gone for, and they've probably spent a little bit more time working it out than we have. I, I thought it was shorter. So 9.40 a.m., Honest Bob Jenrick defends the exemption for the PM. 158 minutes later, long after Warwick had turned to his wife and said, I wonder how long for the U-turn. Why, Warwick? Why did you think on this occasion that they would roll over when so much of their modus operandi does actually involve doubling down on mistakes and pretending that they never happened at all, or if they did, it was all somebody else's fault? Why did you think this one was particularly Because the agreed? lady editor of The Sun was so um, adamant that it was outrageous. Yeah, fair enough. So they, they would have read the room and and the most important people in the room will be the editors of the newspapers that they rely upon to keep the whole sharabank moving you you could be right i i well you, you almost certainly are right i don't know that it would have just been no marks like me on twitter expressing uh, amazement stroke amusement at the mess when their own allies in the media the kind of people who are still using the phrase freedom day turn on them for that particular action then yeah you're almost certainly right there's something um something in the wind. Thank you, Warwick. What will be in the wind moving forward? I don't know. Will this have landed? I could ask you that question. Do you, do you, I don't know. That U-turn yesterday, has it changed the way you look at them? You could talk about echo chambers on the one hand. On the other hand, my sort of angriest correspondents who sadly don't ring in as much as they used to do, but I still get the text and the occasional tweet. Um, uh, the idea that, you know, you're still cheering. You're still, yeah, he's our guy. He's doing his best. Yesterday, when he, he looked you in the eye and just lied through his teeth, did that begin even a little bit to put a crack in the facade of your feeling that he's your man? Oh, I'm staying at home. I'm not staying at home. I'm staying at home. I'm not staying at home. I'm staying at home. I'm not staying at home. And, and by the way, my fans are so utterly, utterly stupid, they're not even, even going to notice the, the trick I've just pulled on them this morning. That's my reading of it. I, I do wonder what yours is. Uh, Mike's in Winsford. Mike, Mark, even. Um, you're a businessman. What are you doing? Um, yeah, we're just uh, listening and just wanted to let you know some sort of real-time data from this morning's trading yes. uh, regarding people wearing masks um, and, and, and sort of adhering to what was yesterday's policy. Um, yes, that's right. So of our first 100 customers, 90% of them were all wearing masks and it was... Really nice, because yes. I was worried about today. I bet you were. And it's not something that is ordinarily in your... Responsibility is not quite the right word, but you've got enough things to worry about without having to become a sort of public health officer in the context yeah. of your own premises. And was that roughly of a piece with last week? Would you have had roughly 10% um, not wearing masks, or has it gone up, or up yeah, a bit? Yeah, but last... Yeah, no, it was, it was probably about the same, but yeah. last week we could tell them not to come in the shop. Um, and we made them wait outside, and we served them from the door um, in the fresh air, which you know felt a lot bit safer. But yes, of course. now they just walk in, and we're not we're not we're not telling them to to stop. And and that's um, your choice. I think you would be entitled that, yeah, to do that, wouldn't you, if you wanted? Yeah, but... it's but the 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 arguments we've had and the abuse we've had and my staff have had is not worth it. It's. And that's, that's where the numbers are pertinent, isn't it? Because it might be a tiny minority of people that, that are in this category, but they are stupid and furious, which is a terrible combination. Yeah. Uh, but what we've noticed is they turn up, uh, we're a sandwich shop, they turn yeah. up coming for some lunch and they're absolutely fine, but they go from the fine to horribly aggressive just by one statement of asking to put a mask on. Do you mind putting a mask um, on? And they're coming at you like Rottweilers. Oh, yeah, uh, it's 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 horrible. It's been really horrible, especially for my staff, you know. I've heard that from people in every every corner of retail, actually. A, t a tiny number in, in terms of percentages, but a, such a toxic 
minority that they end up defining how you feel about your whole day at work. So it, it, yeah. it, 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 is it right to say it's better for you now? I, I mean, presumably you'd rather not let them in. You've decided to let them in because it's going to and it's going to make everybody's life easier. And you are allowed to do that now in a way that last week you. Yeah, it's it's nice. <laughs> we yeah. know what we can do and what we yeah. can't do. Um, so we we're following the rules as best we can and in the safest way. But we're all still wearing masks um, yeah. and visors and um, you know and we're I just can't... trying to do what we can each day to keep ourselves safe and yes. to keep the business going yeah. and. Um, it's not been, you know, joyous. No, <laughs> no, it hasn't. And, and you know, something has to give. And, and I'm glad to hear that you've got the kind of clientele that would would help you in, in moving up to a slightly less restricted environment. It would be even better, of course, if everybody continued to wear a mask ra rather than just 90%. And I, and I do... I, well, hopefully that ship has sailed. If, if we don't go backwards from the current scenario, then you won't have to go back to having scraps with people who are just spoiling for a fight because they've spent too long on YouTube. So I, I, here's a text from Matt in Suffolk, and I think it's fascinating for a whole heap of reasons, some of which we were just touching on um, with, with the, the sandwich shop owner a moment ago. I had a lovely shopping experience in Curry's PC World without my mask and was served by staff who wasn't wearing a mask. But you won't read this out as it goes against your narrative. Narrative. Um, and, and I think the, the academic we spoke to earlier, Colin, who wrote that article that we began the programme with, I think that's what he was touching on. Because I, I, at first glance, that makes no sense whatsoever, does it? But I presume that what Matt feels when he says, you won't read this out because it goes against your narrative, is it, it makes him feel part of something. It was what Colin said about the powerless feeling that they've got power. It's a very odd thing to do at half past 11 on a Monday morning, to, to send a text to a radio presenter, um, uh, boasting, if you like, and also dobbing in a member of staff at Curry's PC World. Thankfully, you only said Suffolk, because I don't even need to check to know that their official guidance will be that all staff need to wear masks unless they're medically exempt. But you, presumably that's what Colin was talking about. There's some sort of power there, is there, Matt? Just for a sort of nanosecond yeah i'm sticking it to them i'm not going to wear a mask and i'm going to tell him that the staff member wasn't wearing a mask and i'm going to say you won't read this out because it goes against your narrative and I'm, I'm trying to sound as charitable as i can but the problem is as i describe what you've just done that the mirror appears in front of you and rather than getting angry with what you see in the mirror you're going to get angry with the person holding it up again aren't you so just hope by just just picking over it like that calmly and I hope kindly, I, I hope you possibly just begin to see the beginnings of the silliness of your own situation. You won't read this out because it goes against your narrative. So the first thing I'd do if you were on the phone is I'd say, what do you think my narrative is? And you'd say, masks work or something like that. And I said, well, don't, don't worry about my narrative. The shop you were in has official guidance to its staff to wear masks. So it's their narrative as well, mate. And then, then what would you say? It's their narrative. It's not my narrative. It's also the government's narrative. So whose who's is the other narrative? It's the really angry people on Facebook, isn't it? It's the really angry YouTubers. And that's the problem that shopkeepers face when... Uh, those of you who don't vent your... Again, I'm trying to be kind. Your silliness. You don't just vent your silliness in daft texts to radio stations. You actually turn up in the shop itself and try to pick a fight. It's just it's just not it's not helpful to anybody. But worst of all, it's turning you into that sort of curdled, angry person who... Um, well, thankfully, it's only a text and you may not even have used your real name. But, uh, I mean, it is just embarrassing, mate. And presumably you're an adult. You won't read this out because it goes against your narrative. There's no sort of us versus them here, Matt. There's science and there's guidance and then there's you. It's not narrative versus narrative or goodies versus baddies. That's science and guidance and then the, whatever the opposite is of the best available guidance and the best available science. And, and it's not a sort of equal battle between people who think the moon is made of cheese and people who think the moon is made of moon. Oh, you won't read this out. The moon is made of camembert, but you won't read this out because it goes against your narrative. So just take a minute, just a second. Have a little think about who did this to you. Because it wasn't me that did this to you. Turned you into the sort of person who sends texts into radio stations saying they're not going to get read out. 
because they go against a narrative. That's probably a phrase you've seen on social media, is it? Narrative goes against a narrative. Well, it's usually agenda as well. It goes against your agenda. So the first thing you've got to do is ask what the words mean, Matt. What does the word narrative mean here? It goes against your narrative that I went to PC World and got served by someone not wearing a mask. But PC World's own guidance is that the staff should be wearing a mask. And if he wasn't, it's because he's medically exempt. So he's medically exempt, and you've just put him at greater risk than he needs to be put at because of your, I don't know, is it an agenda, Matt? Or is it just a lack of understanding or, 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 or allowing this sort of powerless, impotent fury that you feel about... I don't know what it's about, about, I don't know. Maybe you're not allowed to see the kids. It could be that, couldn't it? But whatever it is that's made you this angry has now put you in a position where if you're telling me the truth, you've exposed someone who is medically vulnerable to a higher risk of coronavirus infection than they need to be exposed to because they're not wearing a mask due to a medical exemption and you're not wearing a mask due to an intellectual exemption. And that's a lot less sympathetic. But do keep sending texts. Uh, 20 minutes to 12 is the time. It's time to do some uh, clubs, I think, at the moment. I would like you to tell me what you thought when you saw the footage or heard the Vox Pops. And that's all I'm going to do now. Straight up, down the line. What, what were your thoughts and feelings? I'll tell you what mine were, but let's just refresh ourselves a little bit first. <laughs> Normal. Are you what? worried about COVID at all? No! no! When there's a wave of COVID, now. Why are we waiting not open up? Well, well, we we loads of cases, but who cares? Yeah. It's like the flu. We're going to have the best night in the world. Get the rave on. Uh, I'm not bothered, so I don't think loads of people... No one's bothered really now, so... I think if you want to wear one, wear one. It's not. Uh, we all brought masks in case they made us queue up before 12, but... Not for that. You'd have to wear them anyway. Sound. Sound. Charlotte Lynch doing the business with her microphone there up in Newcastle. And I, 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 I want you to know, um, I want you to tell me just how that makes you feel. The, the footage itself, the, the visual footage, the filmed footage is even more arresting, especially if you are still, I don't know what the correct way to describe this is, if you still are nostalgic for, for, for clubbing. So my first gut reaction was, oh, you silly sausages. Also, I was on a train, and a lot of trains at the weekend, because I went to mum's. And it, 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 I, do, I don't like being the guy who says to the guard, are you going to ask people to put masks on? And I certainly don't like the guard who says, yes, 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 of course I am. I can't force them to do, but I will ask them politely. And then doesn't. He literally walks past me. And, and <sighs> it was hot. There's air conditioning on trains. And this is ridiculously generalising. But young people were uh, demonstrably less likely to be wearing masks on the trains I took. I did London to Birmingham and back, and then Birmingham to Kitty. Birmingham to Kitty, oddly, was, was all right on the masks. Presumably because it's quite a short hop. It's a 40-minute journey. If, if you're on a two-hour journey and you're with your mates and you're having a conversation, then I guess, I guess you're going to be more likely to take it off. And then there were the ones, and I think I, I'm a bit like this. I'm just getting a little bit more conscientious of it at the moment. I'm not sure why. But the... The people who only put their mask on when the guard came round. And I thought, what's the point of that? As a, and I, I probably would have been a bit like that at some point. And they, on this occasion, I'm, I'm wearing the mask for the whole thing. I get into the quiet carriage. And for a bit, I think from, was it from Milton Keynes to Birmingham International? Gosh, great storytelling this. It's like Peter Ustinov never left us. So I think from Milton Keynes, would it be Milton Keynes? Anyway, there was one bit where I, I couldn't see anyone else in the carriage. I stood up and, and I think there might be someone right up at the other end. And in that circumstance, I did do a bit of a Nadim Zahawi. And I thought, well, I could probably take it off now and eat some licorice all sorts. I know you're thinking, well, you're allowed to take it off anyway if you're eating, but I was just being careful. It's taken me 49 years to develop even a scintilla of maturity. So I hope you're going to allow me to enjoy it a bit while it lasts. But young people, and I don't know if this has happened to you as you get older, I am now very bad at gauging people's ages. I, I, you know, anywhere between, I would say, roughly 17 and 30. Okay, all, all look the same to me now. <laughs> It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm looking, I think, at three people. Do you all fall into that category, age between 17 and 30? Couldn't even begin to put you in age order. I, I, I'm all fresh-faced young lads working on the show today, and, and, and cheeky chappy demeanours staring back at me through the soundproof glass. I wouldn't have a scooby-doo where you were, but I presume you're all over the... You, you, you're about 17, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I've, I've lost that 
capacity to judge. So when I say young people, I think I mean under 25s, but it's possible I mean 25 to 30 as well. Not a lot of mask wearing going on on public transport, got to be honest with you. And the problem with that, of course, is you are currently most likely to be infected. So I, I, I can get on my high horse. I could get po-faced. And, and yet at the same time, I just get it. Those kids there sounded, they probably don't thank me for calling them kids. Those young people, young people, they just sounded, they sounded sound, didn't they? They've been cooped up. I heard two girls earlier being interviewed somewhere else, two young women, sorry. Um, they turned 18 during lockdown and she said, we're 20 years old now. We've been waiting for this for 18 months. And I don't know what to say to you because I don't normally do cognitive dissonance. I'm normally the, you know, the, 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 the arch critic, the dismantler, the viral phenomenon who picks apart other people's cognitive dissonance. But I think it's really, really stupid that the clubs have reopened. But I really, really get why you went. And I probably would have done as well if I was your age. Let's see if this works as a radio phone. And get, give me a call and tell me what you are thinking stroke feeling when you see stroke here, young people going bonkers on the dance floor. And I, I just thought of that Sophie had expects to track, haven't I, as well? Because that's the other danger, of course, that you are, in a sense, flirting with murder on the dance floor, but certainly not in the sense that she meant when she sang that song. Uh, quarter to 12 is the time. The number you need is 0345 A slightly lighter conversation, I hope. And, well, there it is. I mean, that's all I've got. Here are my feelings. I, I think it's absolutely crackers that they're letting people in with absolutely no checks whatsoever. And they're going bonkers on the dance floor. But at the same time, is it empathy I'm feeling when I hear those voices, those young voices cooped up for 18 months? There's another lad talking about how he's so sociable. I'm a really sociable lad, me. He said it was a Leeds accent rather than a Geordie accent. And I just thought, oh, you just sound lovely, mate. And you've had a right old time of it, haven't you? Cooped up in your bedroom for all this time. So how does that work? Oh, it's almost like I'm treating my radio show like a therapy session, this. How does that work? How can I be simultaneously convinced that this is insane behaviour, but feeling very warm towards the people doing the insane behaviour? I know what that is, in a way. That's the 42%, 42%, isn't it? So because I am, it's the government's fault that you're behaving like this, I'm not going to blame you, but 42% of the population will not be blaming the government for the fact that you've been committing murder on the dance floor. They'll be blaming you. Go on, give me a call, just so I feel less lonely. Um, and there it is. I, this is rather lovely, actually, because Martin's been in touch and speaks directly to my heart. He says, clubs really shouldn't be open, James. I'm terrified, but I can't wait to go clubbing on Friday. I love you, mate. I'm, I'm not sure how I'll feel when I get there. Probably a mixture of guilt, fear, relief and excitement. And just when you sort of thought, I said it was a therapy session, uh, Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore has uh, been in touch. I don't think she's listening. She's responding to a, to a tweet I put out earlier, making the points I just made to you. But she is a professor of psychology and cognitive neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. She's an expert in adolescent brain development. So I was thinking she's probably going to give me a ticking off here for saying, I don't understand why I'm, I'm, I think it's a disaster that the clubs are open, but I would have gone if I was 21. And this is a professor of psychology and cognitive neuroscience at Cambridge University, mum. And she says, this is exactly how I feel. <laughs> Seeing the photos of young clubbers makes me simultaneously feel really happy and excited for them at the same time as, oh my God. And it, 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 it's the footage more than the audio. I'm normally a great believer in the pictures being better on the radio than they actually are on the telly. But on this occasion, you really need to see that midnight went off. Oh, man, if you've never been in a club when it all goes off, that's just... That's, it, it, yeah, ah, ah. So I totally get it. But I don't think you should be there. Riddle me that. Alex is in Oxford. Alex, what would you like to say? I mean... I was in a club last night, um, and I, I've got to say, going on a bit apprehensive. But when you get there, you are a bit. You go back into the the mode again, yes. like it was pre lockdown. I'm sure you think, do. If they're open, you can't blame me for going. Yeah, you, know, you go to pubs and they're open, and young people. You know, I'm a young person myself. I say young people, mm. still thirty. Um, 
you know, we've had an awful time with universities no, or A-levels of schools, you know, know, and I've got so many friends who just haven't had the chance to go clubbing yeah. or experience what it's like yet. And, you know, you can't blame us for going if it's open. Well, you I see, I can. Uh, and, and that may be the point. I, I'm not going to, but 42% of the population are going to blame you if it goes pear-shaped as a result of you going clubbing, and 42% are going to blame the government. And that's the problem, but also the answer to your question. I'll just read you something that Ricky sent in when um, uh, the uh, Monty Panesar, uh, the cricketer, picked up on, on my point about clubs a little earlier today, and, and uh, Ricky's replied to him and said, riddle me this. So I suspect he might be listening to the programme. He says, I currently have COVID. However, I don't have a cough or a fever or any loss of smell and taste. I went for a taste test just in case, and it turned out positive. Now, imagine me not going for that test and hitting a club at midnight. I genuinely feel all right. I could have infected the entire club. And I, I, when we factor in asymptomatic infections... Alex, I mean, I don't need to paint you a picture, do I? No, no. I mean, obviously, you are... I think if you go there, you are taking on the risk that you're going to, you know... And then you're going home. The rest of the process, and you're going home. Or to and, work. Or to, yeah, but you take on that personal responsibility. But it's so not it's personal responsibility, because you might infect me. And I'm taking personal responsibility by not going to a club. But I'm sitting next to you on a bus. Yeah, but on tra public transport stuff, but you have to wear it. And if people don't All wear right, it... I'm sitting next to you at work. I, I just think that when no, I do, I do too, and I'm, gonna, I'm giving you a bit of a duffing up because you're here, but I don't mean it. It's not, I, compl I would have done what you did, but don't use the word personal responsibility because that is a meaningless slogan that the government is using to excuse its own abnegation of responsibility. You said you can't blame me for going to a club. I'm telling you that 42% of the population will blame you for going to a club if the figures go off a cliff as a result. And when you factor in asymptomatic infections and, you know, people who've got a bit of a sniffle but it hasn't crossed their mind they've got COVID-19 and nothing's going to keep them out of the club tonight it's a petri dish and you're in it I, I just think if the government has opened the clubs you can't blame you can't, you can't just keep saying that are. of course they can I, I know you can't keep saying that yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I am you can call me if you want you can call me Mr Buzzkill today if you want <laughs> Take a call. oh dear and he's right and i'm not having a go or i am having a go but i'm not having a go this seems to be the motto of the moment doesn't it i am doing it but i'm not doing it wear a mask but don't wear a mask self-isolate but don't join don't self-isolate join a uh, pilot scheme but don't join a pilot scheme okay I, and i'm going to use alex as an example because he was first in the queue people who are not going to be going clubbing anytime soon or possibly ever again oh ever again Oh, no. Whatever, again? Um, do you blame him? 0345 6060973. Is that, that is perhaps the thing, the most interesting thing we've stumbled across today. If the relaxation of coronavirus rules leads to a large increase in cases and hospitalizations, who, if anyone, do you think would be mainly responsible for this? 42% say government, 42% say individuals. So when Alex says, it, 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 you can't blame me, that's the point. You can. But half of us apparently won't. Tim's in Leeds. Tim, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Tim. So, I'm, I'm 27. Um, I've spoken to you before, actually, about the, the situation in, in intensive care, particularly around last Christmas. You're a nurse, so, I remember. You're an yeah, ICU nurse, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So, I, um, obviously, I'm 27, but pre-COVID, I used to be out most weekends. I wasn't working. I'd be out all the time, really big social life. And now... It's almost a bit like that vampires have to be invited in to go over a door. I just feel like I'll be stood at the door and I'll just think there's this big moral dilemma where yeah. I can see what is starting up in work and I can see the way that it's going to go. And part of me, A, doesn't want to get COVID and have to sit at home doing nothing and not going to work. And B, I, I just think it's a terrible idea. But I'm 27 and I, and I want to do it. And... <sighs> I think other other friends in healthcare, my, my boyfriend's a doctor and he's said it's a, a bit different to me that he thinks the healthcare professionals shouldn't be going to clubs because we need to take that responsibility when we know what is happening. But at the same time, that is not our, that's not our decision to make and that's not our call and that puts even more responsibility on us than what is already landing on us. So it's, it's a big moral 
dilemma for me, really. I've got no idea what you're going to do. No, I don't either. Oh. I think, I think, in, <laughs> I think in time, yeah. in time, it will gradually. I will gradually come round to it. Of course you will, but that but will be linked to why. what happens at work and what happens overall with infection rates, won't it? I think it will. Yeah, and I I walked around Leeds at midnight last night. Um, I didn't go into anywhere, but I was just looking in and I couldn't work out. You were doing I was... so, I think it's called passive clubbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or clubbing by osmosis. <laughs> and uh, just listening listen to the music and watching them, but not getting involved. And I yeah. just... I. I felt really happy in yeah. ways, and I had loads of friends that went out last night. But at the same time, there's something in me that is just ticking in the back of my head that this is going to be short-lived. I, I, I really think it will be short-lived, to be honest. The, Call the, me Mr. Buzzkill as well. The, what you mean, you think the clubs will shut again? I wouldn't be surprised. And just briefly, Tim, a, a quick word about what works like at the moment. We're seeing numbers go up. I know the Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham uh, get postponed non-electives. Um, for two days because the coronavirus numbers were so high the bit i've never got my head around is the argument that we've got to we've got to relax the lockdown because of people who aren't getting treated for non-coronavirus related illnesses where you think well the worst thing you need for that is full hospital so what what's the what which way is the wind blowing at the minute well yeah that's the thing that i really struggle with i'm yeah. uh, my intensive care is a lot of a lot of big surgeries and the need critical care afterwards mm. and the, the, it is ending up in a similar sort of situation to what it has where the numbers are going up and they are taking up quite a big significant of a major city's yeah. hospital capacity and resources and that is only going to continue to go one way and unfortunately when you get hundreds of thousands of cases happening even if a lot of them are in younger people you will get the unlucky ones that do end up very very unwell that will always happen and I think those numbers are going to continue on a trajectory and I think it is going to get bad and it's already not great. So we shall cross our fingers, um, but also hear in our minds the, the, the famous words of Lord Farquhar, which is some people are going to die, but that is a risk I am prepared to take. It should almost be Boris Johnson's nickname now, shouldn't it? It's uh, Tim, take care. Thanks for everything you do. I, I like that idea. I think if I'd lived in, a, in, a, in, a, in town, in town centre, I probably would have gone for a little bit of a wonder last night as well, just to just to absorb some of the euphoria by a sort of process of passive clubbing or or a sort of uh, nightclub osmosis. Paul, who describes himself as socially distancing since 1975. Um, yeah, well, here's the thing. Our nightclubs opened up three weeks ago in Freiburg in Germany. As of tonight, they're not allowed to open again because the incidence rate is above 10 in every 100,000 over five days. That's the way it's done in Germany. Masks always indoors unless seated. Holland, 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 I heard about this morning. They, I think they've apologised to young people for, for misadvising them on the Johnson vaccine, telling them that as long as they were vaccinated, they could go out safely. Whereas, in fact, it takes 10 days or something to kind of uh, inoculate you to get into your system properly. We, we know that Holland have uh, reversed the kind of stuff that we are doing today. I don't know that there's a country in, in comparable... Uh, coronavirus situations and by comparable I mean they won't be doing as badly as we are in terms of new infections but they will be um, a part of the uh, huge constituency of countries that didn't go didn't manage to pull off a New Zealand style containment um, as in you know keeping it out of the country I I, I, I can't imagine there's another country that is in the top 20 say for new infections that is relaxing things as much as we are. And here's the problem. I wonder whether the government are banking on this sort of feeling. I, I wonder whether they are, in a sense, um, kind of banking on partly what Alex said about, well, the government have said it's okay, so you can't blame me. Coupled with this sort of, oh, I, 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 can't, I can't do it. I, I, I can't do it. I can't give you a coating today. I don't think I should. Because I completely understand why you're doing. I don't think you should be allowed to do what you're doing, but I can't give you a kicking for doing it. I just haven't got the stones, you know. I, 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 I partly because I know I'd be there myself, and that's one hypocrisy that I don't want to indulge in. Giving you a coating for going clubbing when I know if I was your age, I'd have gone myself. 
But the other thing is something a little harder to pin down. I don't know quite what it is. It's a sort of warped empathy. I wish you weren't allowed to do it, but I, I can't, I can't criticise you for doing it. And then you see that number there, 42% are going to blame the government, 42% are going to blame each other. And you sort of think maybe that is the plan. What would you do if you were Boris Johnson? You've got Brexit hard man Steve Baker and his weird mates shouting at you on, on the one hand. Ian Duncan Smith, who's unlikely to be going clubbing anytime soon, I grant you, but has since March of last year been arguing against lockdowns, even as the death rate went through the roof. Still still making the same argument. Quite incredible, that, really. What are you going to do? Johnson's got to keep them sweet. At the same time, he knows that things are going to get a hell of a lot worse before they get better. So create a scenario in which he'll only get some of the blame? If these numbers are correct, you'll only get half of the blame. A few of you are asking what the um, other 16% are going to blame in the event of a massive spike. And, well, on the YouGov poll, it is simply... Actually, I don't know if it's YouGov. Forgive me, it's in the Times today. Someone else, or don't know, is 15%. So 42 plus 42 plus 15 is 99%. It means 1% of people asked are not going to blame the government. They're not going to blame each other. They're not going to blame someone else. Uh, and neither are they don't know. What would that 1% be? I don't know. Margin for error? Sam's in Bristol. Sam, what would you like to say? Um, hi, James. Love the show, by the way. Thank you, mate. I don't really know what to do as a young person. <laughs> I, I, it is, uh, I've just turned 20. Yeah. Um, the guidance isn't really guidance, as I always imagine that once Freedom Day or whatever they call it comes, uh, I'd feel a lot more free. Yeah. And um, so I call in to say my girlfriend is 19. Hmm. She turned 18 over the pandemic. Yeah. She was at Lakota last night, which is a club in Bristol. And uh, whilst I don't think I would be rushing out to go to a club on the first night, I'm not really sure I can blame her. No. Because she's never got to experience going out to a club as a legal adult before the pandemic. But, but, and now she's had to wait until she's closer to being 20 than she is 18. As soon as, as soon as the doors are open, she's in there. And you completely understand why. You know, I, I know you know what I'm about to say. But if she was there and she's your girlfriend, you might as well have been there yourself. Yeah, well... Presuming this, this that you, you're, you're in, you know, contact with each other and all the rest of it. This is the thing. I can't stop her from doing it, though. It's, it's, there's nothing to stop people from doing it now. I'm still quite cautious. I'm still going to be wearing masks in shops and trains. I get trains quite a lot. I'll be wearing them on there, especially places like essential supermarkets, because I'm a firm believer of the fact that people have to go to the shops. Yes. So those people might be vulnerable. I need to protect them in any way I can. But as a young person, as a person that's in this age where we should, where, you know, where we should be able to enjoy stuff like this, I can say the guidance isn't clear enough. And I think it, it goes without saying, but Clarity you keep leadership. on referencing the Matt Lucas video and it is yeah. the most perfect... Go clubbing, but don't go clubbing. Go clubbing, yeah, but don't it, go it, clubbing. And it literally is. And I'm in two minds because I always imagine that once I could go clubbing, I would. What we want, we want a clarity and leadership day, don't we? We don't want a freedom day. We yeah. want a clarity and leadership day. Just one. We take that now after 18 months of neither. One day where they provide 100%. clarity and leadership. Because you know in your bones that you shouldn't be going. But of course. I'm about to say in your feet, you know that you might need to. <laughs> this is the thing. And I'm not sure when the first time that I go out will be. I'm not sure if it will be. I, I, I simply don't know. I'm in a constant battle in my mind whether it is acceptable to go out. Because on one hand, I know realistically i shouldn't be going because of the rise of cases but on the other hand the people that i pay taxes towards and that are making the uh, telling you decisions that on what i can and can't do you. are telling me i can do and well, if yeah, you and if of. and if you and your I thought, i'm not going to be inappropriate but if if you and your girlfriend uh, get romantic in the next couple of days then you might <laughs> as you might as well have been in the club with her because anything and, she's caught you can catch better and that's the thing, we've, we've already talked about it and PCR tests are going to be taken and right. natural flow tests are going to be taken it. in the meantime. Make sure you buy but flowers first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, th that's the thing, but w what more can you do? No, I, I know, I, I can't I know, stop her from going, I also can't blame her for wanting to go because I'm not, there's a part of me that wants to go out myself, but I also there's a big part of me that's saying, hold on, is this the right thing to be doing? I simply don't know because there's... N as a young, impressionable person, like like we, we're always told that we are by the media, you know, these young, impressionable people, they aren't getting the vaccines, they're going out, they're doing whatever they want. I need 
I feel like sometimes I do need a little bit of guidance. We all do, mate. Guidance. We all do, actually. And it's really honest of you to say it. And, and really clear, actually. Much clearer than anything that you're getting from above. Is that you, what, what am I supposed to think? Alex in Oxford really took your position to its natural conclusion. And, and that is, well, if I go and it's bad, you can't blame me. But, of course, it's, if it's bad, then who do you blame? You should blame the people who've created the idea that it's fine to go. That's not the club owners either. Certainly not the fellow clubbers. It's the people in charge. Phil's a DJ. He's not just a DJ. He's a promoter, an events coordinator, a booker, a tour manager, and a director of music for um, fashion shows. DJ Chil Chung. And he's right on the money. And he's obviously well plugged into it, more so than me and you, Sam. He writes, after the pilot test events, the government, along with the events research program, should have come up with industry-specific guidance before this week. I've been seeing all weekend across dozens of venues and festivals, large and small, everybody's been left to devise their own actions. And, and again, you know, it, it, listen, it's easy to snipe from the sidelines. It's a very good living, actually. Um, but the passports, other countries have done it. You just do it. And, and of course, the problem then is that we've opened up before the younger generation have been vaccinated on anything like the scale that they need to be vaccinated on to have filled up the clubs this weekend. So that's what I would have done if I was in charge. I know people hate it, and I know that there are arguments about it, but they're usually arguments, usually, not always, coming from the same people who are opposed to taking the knee or who thought Brexit was a good idea, powerless, angry people who think that somehow this makes them briefly relevant. Get a part, get, get a vac, just show me your vaccine pass, and I'll let you into my club. Right? There it is. It's not ideal, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's got to be better than having petri dish nights at every club up and down the land. 12.13 is the time. Jake's in Andover. Jake, what would you like to say? Um, I think you first asked what I feel, like what we feel when we see the, the young people clubbing. And I am a young people, albeit I've had my <laughs> university years and all that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and, and I thought I was lucky, really. Um, and what yeah. I mean by that is I live in the countryside and a lot of my mates live in the countryside and and we can meet up like yesterday, lovely weather, could go mm. for a swim, could see my mates outside. And actually for quite a long time, my life's been quite normal. Yeah. But if I lived in a city, I'd have been the first one in the door clubbing. Um, so I think like when I see these people, I'm if like... If you were God, still at I'm college, so if you were still at university, you would have been as well, I suspect. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And yeah, I think here, I'm lucky because I know how bad it is. But that, it does take one person with no symptoms. And that room, if it's a Delta variant could be all infected now and someone could get long COVID and even one person getting that is is terrible. Well, that, that you're the first person to mention long COVID today and I, and I feel that's remiss of me. I, 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 you know, I can't do it all day, every day, but this is going to be the big story moving forward and, and it is not a possibility or even a probability. I would say it was a stone cold certainty that thousands of kids, young people, caught COVID last night and that a significant yeah. proportion of them will develop long COVID as a result. Yeah, and I've seen guys I know that play professional rugby and now their lungs pretty much aren't working. And um, yeah, I'm just grateful that I've had a social life that's not then mm. been relied upon to... I can't believe you not mentioned tossing a coin in the air and calling both heads and tails. So that <laughs> couldn't be. It should be the heads or tails day, never mind the freedom day. <laughs> You're not, of course you're right. It is that, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, if everything goes fine, we were geniuses uh, for letting it's everyone go clubbing. It. Call me Mr. Freedom. And if everything goes south, it's all your fault. Um, and I'll call you Mr. Buzzkill. Yeah, you're right. I bet everything's like that at the moment. Even I sometimes, Jake, get a little fatigued with my own, with the accuracy of my own catchphrases. Take care, mate. It's a really generous analysis of it as well. And, and again, it's the opposite of what they're trying to do to us. That Orwell line is haunting me today about a family that pulls together against a common enemy. His description of England in 1941, because of these ludicrous culture wars, that this uh, dreadful character who used to organise orgies for rich people and is now constantly fetishising flags and statues and right in the middle of the Downing Street operation and the taking of the knee and all of that, they've stopped us coming together. As a, so we always think it's 100% right or 100% wrong. And there it is. Look, if I was young, if I lived somewhere else, I probably would have done it. But at the same time, I wish the people that did do it didn't do it. And that's what leadership is about, deciding what we should and shouldn't do. Not telling us to, you know, Toss a coin in the air and decide for ourselves or lick our finger and see which way the wind is blowing. 12.16 is the time. I've got room for more calls on this. 0345 6060 
973. Um, and I will also remind you that I, what businesses are doing is in the mix as well, I think, still. What, what, what are you going to do with regard to your shops? And quite good report so far. A few of you pointing out, quite rightly, that anyone going into a shop without a mask is spreading aerosols that could be picked up by anybody else. So it's suboptimal. But equally, you know, the idea of the current scenarios continuing indefinitely is... Is, is, is tough too, you need. It's just some nice little information for you. National Treasure, an all-round good guy, Gary Lineker, just drawn attention to a scam that is currently doing the rounds. So be warned, if you get a text that says, Hi, it's an NHS colon, Hi, as a vaccinated individual, you are eligible for a COVID pass, giving you no travel requirements and full access into restaurants and public events. Apply via, and then it gives you a link to click on. Um, it looks like a scam because it, it, it comes from a sort of random looking mobile phone number. But just to confirm, it categorically is a scam. So anything like that popping up on your phone and do, I, I don't know, does it still apply to tell older relatives? I don't know if it does. It, I mean, it does if you're talking about people in their 80s, but I presume most people now are quite literate with this sort of thing. But just tell everyone there's a scam going, another scam going around. If you want a COVID pass, you've got one. If you've been vaccinated, it's it's on the it's on the NHS app. All, all, all the there's two NHS apps. There's the one that you need to um, uh, you know the NHS COVID nineteen app, which is the pinger, and then there is the the other one. He calls it the actual NHS app, which is your overall medical re not medical records, but your sort of. Um, it is your medical records, your NHS login. Um, and that will have the details of your vaccinations on it. And you can use that as a pass. You need to uh, set it up. And to f get full access, you need to prove your identity. So you need either a passport or a driving license or something else, I think. But, th but that, th you can use that. So there's no way. And that's completely free. You can set that up on your phone right now. So never, ever, 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 ever click on something offering you anything that sounds too good to be true. Are you writing this down? It's, it's quality stuff, this. 21 minutes after 12. Back to clubbing. Um, Jim's in Edinburgh. Jim, what do you reckon? Hello, James. Hello, Congratulations James. on your programme. You're James, I'm going to be a real party to here. A, a buzzkill. You're going to be bu buzz, buzz Killington. you're going to be today on the programme. Go on. Right, okay. I know, I'm going to be a bad guy. Listen... I think it's completely wrong to open clubs. Mm. I sympathise totally with young people, what they've got to do, but the risk of passing this virus, and the young people themselves getting it, is far too high, particularly in an area like a, a, a nightclub. So I've got to come out and say, no, it shouldn't be done. Well, that's fine. I, I, I get it. But you've got to look them in the eye and tell them that, and they'll tell you that, you know, some of these people turned 18. 16 yep. months ago. They've never been clubbing legally in their lives and yep. of course law-abiding yep. people have never been clubbing at all. Sam's girlfriend went out last night yep. to, to Kota, totally was it? I totally agree and I have total sympathy. Jim, yeah. I'm going to, James, sorry. Yeah, Jim, Jim works, thing, Jim works. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Anyway, so I was going to say, <clears throat> sorry, look back. Yeah. And I'm looking at the whole, the, the, back, back the picture a bit, right? You've got a government, one, that was ideolo ideologically wrong from the start yeah. and also are electioneering, not governing, okay? Yeah. Now, when Given. I'm saying ideologically, you look at the whole thing about, right at the start, about um, procuring pro uh, COVID stuff. It was all uh, ideological. They went out and they were going to have it in the, the, the private sector and they were going to buy this, going to buy that. And they ignored the NHS to a certain extent and they also ignored local government, local areas. Yeah. Now, this was wrong, and you mentioned this morning, James, about Test and Trace and the, the mix-up of the names. Yeah, I can't even get the name right. Fifth, NHS 16, the 16, of when it shouldn't be there. No, it's not well, an they, NHS. no you're right. They, 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 they kind of try to paint it as that. I, I, I hear yeah, you. They, What's they, the score in Scotland? Are the clubs open in Scotland? I, I should be up on this already, but while you're on the line, I'll no, ask it's okay, you. No, okay, James. No, they're not open in Scotland. Oh, there but you go. But um, I, it's no, with me, it's... it's um, it's not really, uh, well, we're, we're not opening and you're opening. My, my concern is for the, the young people in Of course it is. In it's going to go England. through. No, it is. You, know? you could not come up with better laboratory conditions for the transmission of a virus than a nightclub. I genuinely mean well, that. 
Giving you because it just spells them through with, aerosols. People are yeah, shouting, yeah. they're singing, they're leaning into each other's ears yeah. to talk. You know, because you can't hear it over the thumping bass lines. I mean, it is. It is. If you got to write, if you and I sat down now and came up with ten things you could do in a room to massively increase, to yeah. maximise yeah. the likelihood of passing on an infection, we'd come up with a nightclub. Absolutely, James. And I'll tell you something. My family are scientists, as some as for scientists and doctors in their family. So we've got quite. I'm not, but we've got quite a good kind of rapport right for the start on, on the information. And ex what you said is exactly true. That if you wanted to spread COVID, mm. you could find no better one than doing that. And it is totally irresponsible of the government to actually abdicate. This shouldn't be Freedom Day. It should be Abdication Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, freedom to... Jog on would be, would be the advice which uh, Alistair Campbell offered to the government in rather more Anglo-Saxon terms yesterday, or to the Prime Minister in particular. Jim, take care. Sir Hat's in Newcastle. Sir Hat, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, well, I'm 23. Um, I'm doing my master's degree right now. I've been in Newcastle for four years, and I'm just so against the clubs opening. Are you? Like, yeah, I mean... I'm not the type, I mean, I'm the type of person who used to go out three to four times a week. Like, there have been moments where, where me and my friends would be at the library at 1 a.m. We would just look at each other and just say, do you, are you thinking of why I'm thinking? And we would go out and not do our work. But this is just, I don't know what Boris is thinking, but the, uh, opening up the clubs when... Are you not even a bit tempted? No, not, I can't get vaccinated. So okay. this isn't even me being biased at okay. all. Like... I, I, my neighbours are nurses. I've, I've seen what it's done to them, and with hospital cases rising again, and although our death rate is quite low, the, the long COVID. My mum and my dad were one of the first thousand people to get COVID in the UK. Okay. My mum, my mum still coughs as if she has iron lungs. Uh. Like it's not appealing whatsoever, and she doesn't go out anymore, even to like to shops because she gets looked at if she were was to cough. Of course she does, yes. Like, a, I mean, oh, so, yeah, so, I mean, you're coming at it from a, a, a specific angle, but you're coming at it clear-eyed. Do you bother trying to talk to some of your peers about why I they mean, shouldn't go out? Because, I mean, I, you're, you're ex, you're not ex-mates, but you're former clubbing pals. I mean, some of my friends did go out last night, and I, they, they know the rule with me. If they, if they were to do something like this, then I won't see them for at least 10 days until yeah. they have a negative test. But that's just because of my case. But no, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's just a bit nuts that if you, it's like the cues. I went on Twitter last night and I just looked at on videos all across the country where like young people were waiting just to go to the clubs. I mean, there oh. are bigger things to do in life than just go to a club. Yeah, but you used to go three or four times a week, so you can't have your cake and eat it. I, know, I mean, there I know, are, of course there are bigger things to do in life, but, but, but equally, it's, you know... Ugh. But when the, when, when the world has changed, there are things to think about. So a lot of my friends, they're leaving their homes in Newcastle because their tenancies are coming up. Yeah to an end and like this is the period where new people move in and new leave yeah and i know i know one of my friends who are leaving their home in three days time and she, and she was out last night and th there is probably a good chance that she might have caught it there and both her parents um uh, you know have they're quite old sure. i said to her i said to her are you afraid slightly and mm. she said well, I'm staying at my brother's house, and I just thought, well, not everyone has a brother, and not everyone actually cares about And, and that, you remind us, actually, that you're the best caller so far for that, that, that reminder that caution works according to how many people observe it. It's not, I mean, this is why I hate the phrase personal responsibility, and I hated the phrase common sense, because it creates this individualist ideology, this idea that I'll be all right if I look after myself, which is the polar opposite of pandemic tactics the whole point if everybody is cautious we're golden but if 99 percent of people are cautious and one percent isn't then we're compromised and if 52 percent of people are cautious and 48 percent aren't we might as well not be none of us be cautious at all and that that's that's the point you remind us of so I, I, well there's light at the end of the tunnel although i wouldn't put any money on where 
it might be. Take care of yourself. Um, this is nice from Adam, who's in Beverly. So many people on today's show going through the same mental struggle that I'm going through, James. I'm allowed to go out, but should I? My 18-year-old self would have been busting moves all night long. Um, coming up to 29 minutes after 12, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And, and of course, you know, they're, they're, I mean, maybe it's a little unfair to portray all of the people... Uh, pre pretending or believing or or, or 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 arguing that this is all I think we don't need to worry and stuff like that. But remember, all of the uh, restrictions have been lifted today, every single one in in, in England, and there is an anti-lockdown protest in Westminster at the moment. So I, I, I do sometimes think, are we being a bit unkind when we portray these people as being intellectually challenged? So I'll say that again. They've lifted all the restrictions in England today, and there's currently an anti-lockdown protest in Westminster. Um, a, a former colleague of mine, who I won't name because he works for the opposition now, or some of the opposition now, uh, as, as I'm going to forget what the gag was now. I know some, people, can't yes <laughs> people can't take yes for an answer. There it is. That's a cracking line, isn't it? What are you doing today? I'm going to the anti-lockdown protest. But we've re lift, re lift, lifted all these restrictions. Go, yeah, I won't be wearing a mask on the bus down to the anti-lockdown protest. What are you protesting against? Lockdowns. It's from Jem, who's in Newcastle, and she says, My husband is a large nightclub DJ. That's a bit rude, Jem. I, you know, I, man's got to eat. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. <laughs> my, my husband is a large nightclub DJ at some of the large popular clubs in Newcastle. He hasn't worked for the last 18 months and has been looking forward to the nightclubs opening for a long time. He's lost a friend um, due to... Uh, at the beginning of this year, um, uh, due to suicide, Jem writes, at the beginning of this year, just as a, an indication of how, you know, how much he's got on his mind. However, he is now totally torn and apprehensive about returning. He's dreading the situation of drunk people coming up to him for song requests, hanging off his shoulders, shouting in his ears. How can he possibly balance between being the party person and giving the promoters and punters a good atmosphere while telling them to keep their distance to help keep him and his family at home safe? He discovered over the last year that some of his fellow DJs are actually anti-vaxxers, which adds a whole new issue to the mix and and this is i think the point of uh, personal responsibility in that it is supposed to just ride roughshod over proper scrutiny and concerns if you add personal responsibility to freedom day you kind of end up with an alternative universe in which nothing is ever going to be the people the fault of the people who are in charge of everything nothing nothing to do with them all down to you and then you see those numbers 42 percent are going to blame the government if it goes pear-shaped 42 percent are going to blame each other and i think right now boris johnson would take that as a win well only half of them are blaming us <laughs> cogito ergo sum good one chaps wear a mask don't wear a mask <laughs> self-isolate but don't self-isolate uh, go to a club but don't go to a club that's it isn't it half only half of them are blaming us incredible almost as unbelievable as the brexit result um, and there it is. Nigel's not happy. He's in Belfast. He says, some of those people turned 18, James, you keep saying. So, I turned 58. I'm not dead yet. I miss my workmate. Something awful. I've lost one and I couldn't attend her funeral. And to top it all, I'm absolutely gasping for some intimate company. All right, Nigel. Um, but none of these concerns have stopped me doing the right thing. You make a very good point, actually. I, I am making excuses for the young people. You could get into the psychology of it and the, when the cerebral cortex or the frontal lobes of your brain have finished developing. In the case of the, some of the people protesting against lockdown today, you'd have to argue that they may never finish developing. But uh, I, I, I don't know why, Nigel. I'm not going to apologise for it and I'm not going to retract. But if you want to paint hypocrite on my forehead, you can. I just think I, I find it a lot easier to give a break to the young people than I do to the older people. But I recognise your plight and I particularly, you know, feel your pain. 12.36 is the time. Greg's in Putney. Greg, what would you like to say? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, this is really funny. So, first of all, I mean, I'll say I'm, I'm, I'm laying in bed right now with, uh, with COVID. Mm. Um, yeah, thankfully, I mean, it's, it's not too extreme or anything, but it hasn't been the most pleasant uh, last week. And, sure. um, you know, I, I, I went through this exact same thing a week early. I, w I was lucky enough to get a, a ticket to the big uh, Wembley final last Sunday. Oh, wow. And in the few days before that, I said, oh, you know, I don't know. It feels like maybe this is too risky. You know, we're going to be with 70, 80,000 people, but you know, I, I'm double jabbed. It'll, it'll be fine. It'll be safe. Uh, you know, surely we're allowed to do these things. It, yeah. it must be okay. Yeah. That's the and part I, of it, isn't it? Yeah. And I had this nagging feeling, right. You know, I mean, you've, you've been so careful around people and, and I, I'd been to a couple of earlier matches in the tournament and, 
you know, it, it wasn't super comfortable. There was there was more people than I uh, than was okay, and there, there wasn't a ton of mask wearing and that kind of stuff. But I thought, you know, sod it, I, I, I've got to go. Right? I yeah. mean, it's a it's a once in a lifetime thing, and so hopefully not, but probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to this point anyway. Yeah, yeah and, sure. uh, but but so you know, and 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 going there, it was of course. I mean, everybody's heard about about the experience. I mean. Mm. There was no distancing. There was no anything. But but the, the tough part, and, and and where I absolutely feel for people wondering about, you know, can we or should we go to nightclubs? Is I, I sat there the whole time going, I must just be being silly, right? Everybody says it's fine. Mm. I'm double jabbed. I need to just get over this. I'm sure I can go do this. And and so even though I wasn't comfortable with it, I said, all right, all right, all right, and kind of psyched myself up for it. And sure enough, uh, you know, four days later, start not feeling so well mm. and, and 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 tested positive. Don't you know? No, no matter what. So, and that's the cap. Maybe if there is a calculation, the calculation is that for the huge majority of people, it's going to be inconvenient rather than really serious. And that is, but the numbers that are going to be inconveniently ill. Well, you, that's it. That's yeah, what I, mean, I find. That's what I can't currently get my head around. The the one thing I can't imagine though is being you know anywhere over let's say thirty five and not being vaccinated yet. I mean, I in the next couple of weeks, I think it'll just be absolute carnage and and god forbid it's any worse than this i mean yeah for me it's uh well, you're all right you've got a mild dose because you're vaccinated right but you yeah. could still get long covid I, I don't want to rain on your parade you know all this <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and and who knows who during those four days you might have infected who possibly wasn't vaccinated and spread, yeah. i mean the entire i mean one wonders what the numbers would be like i've done we talk about a wembley variant at the weekend but i think that was a, a word play rather than an actual <laughs> Um, yeah, but but and the funniest thing is one of the worst things which I haven't heard too many people talk about at Wembley was it was part of the rules to protect you from COVID. I think that was probably the worst part of it, which was you know they made you go in the stadium, you know depending on on your ticket yeah. up to three three and a half hours early, but they didn't suspend the you know the British football law where you can't drink in view of the pitch, right? Which meant that then for the three hours prior to kickoff, you know all sixty seventy thousand people were crammed into these concourses cheek to jowl for three hours drinking with no masks on. Of course. They would have been better to be either in their seats or out, you know, causing mayhem with everybody else. But I think the most dangerous part was, was like us. You know, we looked and said, ah, oh, it's getting a little bit Larry out here. We should, we should get in the stadium. And I think, honestly, it was that bit where, you know, by quote-unquote following the rules was actually probably the most dangerous bit. Yeah, so... It's a great point, actually. I mean, you were a canary down the coal mine and you got sick. Yeah, and, and you know. So the purpose uh, of canaries down the coal mine used to be if the canary got sick, then everybody else piles out of the coal mine. So it hasn't quite yeah, yeah. worked. It hasn't quite worked in that way, has it? But you make a very valid point, and and I wish you obviously, I wish you a speedy recovery. But a few people, Julie, picking up on that point I made about long COVID is it double jab people who have mild symptoms could still get it. I obviously hope you don't, Greg. But there is a lot of it about children as well. And um, and I, I guess they look. They, I don't know how would you do it? if you could get inside Boris Johnson's mind. What would it look like? Do you think? I'm not doing gags. I'm genuinely wondering. Is if you, if you actually had to, if I, you know, if you could pin him down like we can pin down people who ring in, or politicians on the, on the program. If you really could pin him down, what would it be? It would be well. Look, it's gonna. It's look. We, it, it's gonna be awful. Let's get it over and done with. I think that's probably the closest I can get to the logic, for want of a better word, that he's currently employing. It's going to be awful. Let's get it over and done with. If we'd strung it out for longer, maybe more people would survive. But, you know, so let's just get it over with. And, of course, there is no guarantee we will get it over with. And then we've got the words that we haven't said on the programme yet. Do you know what they are? Yeah, you get a new strain. You get a vaccine-resistant variant that could pop up. And it's only on Saturday that the front page of the Financial Times, which is the closest thing we have in the British media to an international organ, you know, it's a, the Financial Times is not really a, a British or an English newspaper in that sense. It is, you know, it's the go-to journal for, for um, uh, people interested in economics and people involved in money markets and, and business and commerce, high commerce around the world, the Financial Times. I remember a friend of mine who lives in Brussels. She phoned me up after the... And I bumped into her after the vote in 2016, and she was absolutely... She was a friend from the LSE. She just could not begin to understand it. And and she'd gone back to um, uh, Europe, back to continental Europe after graduating. And, and she said, I just don't understand it. How could you... How could this possibly have happened? She was angry with me. I'm like, well, don't know. I'm doing my bit, you know? 
And and then I just said to her, what, what, what newspapers do you read? Do you read any English newspapers? And, and she goes, yes, I read the Financial Times every day. And I thought, ah. And I said to her, just have a look at the mail for a week. And she rang me, or she emailed me the next day and said, oh, yeah, all right, I get it now. So, you know, it's, it's, it's still going. Um, here's a taste from Divya. She says, first cab passenger, James and the brave new world, no mask, wanted the air conditioning on instead of the windows open. Of course, I can refuse entry, but then I might as well sit at home. There's personal responsibility there. Right there, Prime Minister. How, how, tell me where personal responsibility now comes into Divyesh's life, into his actual cab. Earning a crust, 18 months of hell. Today, someone wants to get into his cab, not wear a mask, open the, rather than have the windows open for ventilation, he wants the air conditioning on. Probably because he doesn't believe in it. It's all a big hoax. What's he supposed to do? Get in the cab, but don't get in the cab. Wear a mask, but don't wear a mask. I should probably send Matt Lucas some royalties on this one, albeit that my impression is absolutely rubbish. It is nicking his comic genius and passing it off as my own. But what, what, where is it? Where does it come in there, the personal responsibility? What was he supposed to do? Because as he says, I could refuse entry, but then I might as well sit at home. Doesn't get paid if the meter's not turning. Customers not exactly thick on the ground in town at the moment, as far as I can tell. And here's one. Oh, man. That's it, isn't it? 42% say it's your fault, Divyash. If you get sick, 42% will say it's the government's fault. And Boris Johnson will take that as a win all day long. Um, let's squeeze in one more. Sam's in Clapham. Sam, what would you like to say? Um, well, just coming back to uh, clubs, basically. Mm. I mean, <laughs> it's been a little while now. Um, but I just think that this is basically the only thing that's been offered to young people by yeah. this government. Yeah. Um, this government isn't the government of young people. It's not their choice. Like, if no. you look at all of the polling data, it's, they're not... All the big decisions too. now hinge on people who are over 65. It's it's, it's really quite fascinating reading, looking at, at the, where the... Uh, exactly. You know, where the vote is weighed. And the, the whole point about... 42% will blame the government, 42% will blame each um, other. personal, yeah, each yeah. other. Well, the 42% that are going to blame the government are the 42% that will vote Conservative. So, if you let young people have something like clubbing, maybe some of them will vote for you in the future, mm. and then if it all goes to, uh, if it all goes wrong... Belly up, um, please, Sam. Um, yeah, belly, 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 up, belly up, mate. Belly up, mate, yeah, nearly. Yeah, yeah. all right. If sorry. it all goes <laughs> belly up... Um, then they can turn around and their voters will say, well, it was all the young people and the young people keep voting not for the Conservatives. So it doesn't really matter. I think everything that they do is playing only towards their voters. That's, that's uh, the whole point. I, well, I, I, I can disagree with you on that, I think, because the, the caution and the people who don't want the restrictions to be lifted, the other bit of polling from, from this morning is that 55% of the population think it's wrong to do what they're doing today. And I bet that is quite heavily skewed generationally. To Oh, no, because you, 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 you accommodated that in the votes they can already count on, I suppose. So they're just trying to get some new people to think that they're all right. And if it goes well, lap of honour. If it goes wrong, it's all your fault. I mean, that is it, isn't it? It's government by Shaggy. It wasn't me. Uh, getting jiggy on the bathroom floor. You know, don't shoot the messenger, but this is from Saturday's Times, a uh, report from Israel. Israel faces the prospect of another lockdown only a month after social distancing and mask rules were dropped amid a fourth wave of COVID-19. Government sources warned that if Israelis failed to voluntarily observe social distancing, the country may have to go into lockdown during the Jewish festival of Rosh Hashanah in eight weeks' time. Um, Prime Minister sounded to Try to sound more upbeat. We can beat coronavirus in five weeks, said Naftali Bennett. It's just up to us. <sighs> Might be one of the things Netanyahu got right that, you know. Uh, 12.50 is the time. Theo Ashwood is here. I wonder why. Keir Starmer has been speaking at Labour's uh, central London headquarters, asking questions to the Prime Minister and, of course, trying to eke out some details from uh, Number 10 and increase the pressure on the Prime Minister and the Chancellor Rishi Sunak after that uh, screeching U-turn yesterday when they weren't taking place, well, they were taking place in a pilot scheme, then they were deciding not to take place uh, in a pilot scheme. And, of course, Keir Starmer making the point, James, that this wasn't a pilot scheme open to the vast majority of people. We've seen chaos confusion and cronyism at the heart of government. And we had another example of it this weekend, when the Prime Minister and the Chancellor claimed that they had miraculously been selected for a trial so they could avoid isolation. 
isolation that hundreds of thousands of the rest of us have dutifully taken. With family events cancelled, businesses having to close and workers going without pay, Johnson and Sunak's attempts to dodge isolation were crass and they were insensitive. Keir Stong also pointed to inconsistencies within uh, the Prime Minister's own argument because, of course, yesterday he released a message on social media saying that he'd briefly considered uh, the possibility of a pilot scheme before uh, deciding against it. The Prime Minister's claim that he did look briefly at the idea of taking part in the pilot scheme. That rides coach and horses through the claim that Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak had been magically selected for the trial. It is completely inconsistent with the Downing Street press release yesterday morning saying that they were participating in the trial and the pilot. So let's be clear. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak only went into isolation because they were busted. Interestingly, the Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng said this morning that a decision had been made and that after reviewing that decision, not something that had simply been briefly considered, uh, the Prime Minister had decided with the Chancellor to go into uh, self-isolation. But there are more questions about when uh, the Prime Minister got pinged and what his initial reaction was because, of course, Sajid Javid, the Health Secretary, tested positive on Friday of last week for mm. COVID-19. And we only learned that the Prime Minister was pinged on Sunday morning. And there's question marks about whether he was in checkers when he was actually pinged or whether he was pinged elsewhere in the country, presumably in Downing Street, and then decided to drive to checkers before then owning up to the fact that he was going to have to go into self-isolation. Did Boris Johnson travel to his country retreat after the Health Secretary first had symptoms? You'd have thought that given the amount of money spent on refurbishing Downing Street, he would have been happy staying there as the Chancellor has. But we know that the Prime Minister likes to look for a loophole. We need to know when the Prime Minister was contacted and where he was when he was contacted. We know that Michael Gove tried this ploy back in May after the Champions League final. And of course that question is so important mm. because the Prime Minister would have broken the rules if he, that he was uh, pinged in Downing Street and told to self-isolate when he was in Downing Street and then subsequently travelled uh, to Chequers and that would, of course, have implications. Well, not for pinged, he'd have been contacted, wouldn't he? It was a, the, the test and test trace. Yeah. Yeah, so he'd have had a phone call rather than a mere ping because a ping mm. is not legally binding, but the test and trace, I think, is, as I understand. Yes, but if you're told to self-isolate, then mm. you'd need to be um, in your... In your, just, in your for hands. people who had better things to do than follow the political roundabout this morning let's just have a little listen again to to, to, to to the absolute clown car so robert jenrick we estimate would have been in the back of his ministerial limousine listening to the radio while congratulating himself on having done a bang up job of defending the prime mm. minister and the chancellor of the exchequer on on sky news and elsewhere yesterday morning so here is robert jenrick defending the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. And what time would this have been? This would be about so this would be between 8.01 and 10.38. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister have been contacted overnight by NHS Track and Trace, which shows that the system is doing its job. They will be isolating, but using the pilot scheme for daily testing, which is available to a range of public sector organisations, which enables you to do your essential business and get tested on a daily basis in specialist asymptomatic testing centres like the one that there now is in Downing Street, but then outside of that work environment to not socialise, not mix with other people. You've got one in Downing Street, but the Prime Minister's at Chequers. Yes. OK, no, so he's sitting in the back of the car thinking, well done, Honest Bob. Well, I doubt he calls himself Honest Bob. That's, that's our, our prerogative. Honest Bob Jenrick sitting there going, oh, well done, mate. Yeah, lovely stuff, great stuff. That boss will be pleased with you there. And then this comes up on the radio. We did look briefly at the idea of uh, us taking part in uh, the, the pilot scheme, which allows people to test daily. But I think it's far more important that everybody sticks to the same rules. And that's why I'm going to be self-isolating until the 26th of July, Monday, the 26th of July. <laughs> it takes a lot to feel sorry for honest Bob Jenrick, but I'm close. It's, yes, it's called taking the party, party line. Taking the party line. It was Dean Zahawi's turn this morning yes. um, to, to take the party line. And he, and interestingly... He, his soul seeping out of his he, backside. He backed up the Prime Minister's view that the Prime Minister had 
um, briefly considered <laughs> going, taking part in the briefly pilot considered scheme. by releasing a press release yes. and sending on his Bob but Jenner by the time, to by the time we got to Quasi Quartang, that line was no longer the party line was no longer holding, right. and Quasi Quartang admitted that the decision had been reviewed by the Prime Minister. Which would back up, of course, the fact that there was a statement at 8.01 saying the Prime Minister was taking part in the pilot scheme. And they read the and, room, as the kids say. And then you get to 10.38 and then they release another statement saying that they uh, weren't taking part in the pilot scheme and the Prime Minister was going to self isolate. Oh, what a time to be alive, eh? What a, what a tangled web we weave. And uh, quite a few of you are suggesting that we should do phone-in topics confined to the younger generation more often because the calibre and the, the, the quality and, indeed, I can tell you, the quantity of callers during our club-based chat in the final hour of the programme has been so high. Um, Gareth is in Middlewich. I hope you're not going to ruin it all, Gareth, by sounding old and boring. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I can only give um, you a minute. Sheila's already in the room. What would you like to say? Um, well, I, I, I well, was working as a musician um, before lockdown, and things are starting to open up again. Yes. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think they've really thought. Well, I obviously know they've not thought it through. S simple things like um, I oh. uh, got a phone call this morning saying that someone I was working with has tested positive. You know, they're, they're, um, so I'm going to have to isolate. You know, until I get a test and all of that. They've not really. Nothing's going to change other than there's there's not going to be the financial support when businesses have to close. And that means a lot of people won't do what they're supposed to do. Well, it, mean, it means that, uh, yeah, it means and that. And it also it even means more. That, uh, yeah. And it also means that, like, you know, so weddings, for example, that we've, oh, everyone can have a wedding now. What happens when everyone's poorly? The caterers are poorly, the... You know, the. Well, that, the that, do you know the, tr the tubes? I know you're up in Middlewich, but I got the tube to Euston from home on Saturday, and it, a pretty, I mean, half the lines were shut. And I, I, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bear of very little brain, Gareth, as you know. I was halfway to Birmingham on the big train before I realised why all the tubes were shut. They couldn't get the staff. And then I got to Birmingham, yeah. I, 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 I mean, you know the route, Kiddy, Kiddy to Cradley and then Cradley to Stourbridge. And they chucked ch me off the train in Stourbridge and said they couldn't get staff. So, that, I mean, even that train, they, everywhere you were going, the trains were grinding to a halt because they couldn't get the drivers or the crew. And that is, as you've just brilliantly reminded us, going to extend into every corner of the workforce uh, as the Petri dish that the government is currently introducing as an official policy has its effect upon the population. I think it's going to be worse, much worse. Well, um, I hope not. They, I do they... hope not. They brought me in bang on time. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to leave you in Sheila Fogarty's very capable hands with a promise to do my best to be here tomorrow. Actually, before I go, I just want to give a shout to Sam Mason-Jones, who I have borrowed today from Eddie Mayer. He's come in and done this job at incredibly short notice. It's a sparkling debut up there with the time that Jackie Milburn famously scored six goals during his trial for Newcastle United in the second half. <laughs> Children, they all have to die. I'm happy as a lark now, and it is fine.